Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's June 8th. I'd like to call the business meeting of the Governing Board of the South Florida Water Management District to order. And first on our agenda always is the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd ask, like to ask the uh, Vice Chair if he would lead us in the pledge. If you'd stand, sure. face the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks. I want to see if um, Ms. Meads, Colonel Roman, Mr. Steinley, are you on virtually? This is Ms. Meads. I'm on. Thanks, Joe. Jay Steinley's on, too. Hi, Jay. Thanks, Charlotte, are you on? I know you're having some trouble. I know you're listening. When it comes to voting time, we'll figure out how to get you to vote. Um, Good morning. It's nice to be back uh, here at headquarters this month. Um, we'll be meeting here while we're in hurricane season. Can't be over quick enough for me. Um, board members, I'm going to be asked that you make sure your microphone is on and that you please speak into the mic or on, so online attendees can hear you. If you do turn your head while you're speaking, drag the mic with you so we can capture all your comments. Um, members of the public on Zoom who wish to address the board may use the raise your hand feature. If members of the public are having any trouble and need help, please go to our website, SFWMD. Dot gov and click the Ask Us button at the top of the page so staff can help you. If you're using a phone and you'd like to comment, press star 9 to raise your hand and star 6 to mute and unmute. As a courtesy to others who wish to speak, members of the public are asked to comment only once on each topic. We'll take public comment first from those who are here in person and submitted a comment card, followed by those who raise their hands on Zoom. Switching gears this time of year usually marks the start to the wet season, and it has, so it's a good time to remember the ability to live, work, and raise families here in South Florida depends on the district's water management system. It amazes me to think the system was built more than 60 years ago for 2 million people. Now we've got over 9.2 million people living in this region. Since 2012, the governing board and our senior management team have commemorated the beginning of wet season. We have an item on discussion and on the discussion agenda highlighting Flood Awareness Month, and I'm looking forward to that. But first, I want to express my appreciation to all the men and women of the Water Management District who work year-round to protect our communities from flooding and ensure that South Florida's regional flood control system is ready for storms. I know it's a big job. Um, I know what flooding's like, and we really, really appreciate you. Now, uh, we have a video for Flood Awareness Month. Flood control is a critical component of life in Florida. If you haven't lived in Florida for long, you may not know that our climate has two seasons, wet and dry. Weather in South Florida has a way of ignoring the calendar and expectations of what's normal. We remind ourselves of this fact of living in the Sunshine State each June during Flood Awareness Month. The South Florida Water Management District operates and maintains the region's primary water management system. Vast in scale, the network of canals, levees, and structures was authorized by Congress more than 60 years ago to protect residents and businesses from floods and droughts. This primary system connects to community drainage districts and hundreds of smaller neighborhood systems to effectively manage floodwaters during heavy rain. As a result of this interconnected drainage system, flood control in South Florida is a shared responsibility between the South Florida Water Management District, county and city governments, local drainage districts, homeowners associations, and residents. Operations and maintenance staff at the South Florida Water Management District serve our region from eight field stations, as well as from our headquarters building in West Palm Beach. Field station staff are who you are most likely to see in your community, working every day to make sure the regional water management system operates smoothly and efficiently to provide flood control and protect regional water supplies. Throughout the year, operations and maintenance staff oversee more than 2,175 miles of canals, 2,130 miles of levees and berms, 915 water control structures, 620 project culverts and 89 pump stations. 
They operate and maintain all of the equipment and they have the specialized expertise needed to keep this vast water management system ready for whatever nature sends our way. Moving water to meet varying conditions and needs is essential to sustaining South Florida's people, our environment, and the economy. Make sure you check out our social media channels, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and visit sfwmd.gov slash flood control for the most up-to-date information. Thanks for watching. Uh, thanks very much to our PR department for putting that together. That's excellent. Um, and thanks very much to all those of you out there every day uh, who are working hard to keep us safe. I drove over early this morning, and I, I can't tell you how many district trucks I saw coming across uh, through Clewiston and then in, into Palm Beach County. So th thank you all for everything you're doing. Let's move on to employee recognition, and we can go down into the well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well... We got a few of them this month because we're, take, we're taking care of May and June. Um, so first I'd like to start out with our May 2023 Employee of the Month, and that goes to Tevis Brown, Human Resources Corporate Trainer. <laughs> All right, Tevis, hang out. So it totally fits to have someone from Human Resources starting with uh, employee recognitions, but Tevis is is quite a figure in the South Florida Water Management District. Um, he started in 2019, and he's been very busy ever since. Uh, one of the things that I engage Tevis a lot in is new employee, the new employee celebration, which is where Tevis brings together all of our new employees um, and takes them on a tour of the district, introduces them to Jen and me and the leadership, uh, introduces them to the, the district's history, the control room, the, the lab, everything that we do. So you'll have whoever's coming in, instead of here's the packet and here's some videos to watch, welcome aboard, Tevis does a celebration and he does it so well and everybody really enjoys it. You get to know your incoming class. Um, he's also uh, restarted the mentor program uh, at the Water Management District, putting young, you know, newer staff with older staff, not, e not always in the same place, but to get to know the district and know the opportunities for growth. He's does training for us, 250 trainings in his tenure. And he's also a leadership, uh, it provides leadership for the employee committee. What is that? That's a committee that gets together and creates those cultural events that we have, like a holiday celebration, bring your kids to work, and then other gatherings like a Super Bowl thing, you know, things that bring us together to interact as a family. Uh, Tevis is just a great guy. He's, an, he's got an infectious personality. He really, uh, it's perfect. When you have a new employee, meet Tevis, right? It's what you want to happen. He's, he's absolutely deserving of the May Employee of the Month. Congratulations. Next, we have our May 2023 Team of the Month, and that's our Taylor Slough Flow Improvement Project Team. This is a big team, and I'll tell you why after I read their names. We have Matt Morrison, Holly Andriata, Barry Brown, Ryan Brown, Jesse Browning, Diane Cruz, De Leon, Luis DeLeon, Brian Furland, Steele Holiday, Ronnie Hudson, Nimi Jayakumar, Ozell Jones, Zach Kilgore, Claudette Livingston, Brian McEachern, Cody McElroy, uh, Michael Moda, Quincy Moulton, Jeremy Padrick, Luis Colon Pinero, Robert Prescott, Armando Ramirez, 
Jorge Serrano, <laughs> Jenny Smith, Sandra Smith, James Sneckenberg, James Strickland, Greg Toulon, Omero Torres, Matthew Van Leeuwen, Natasha Warwick, Richard Whipple, and Linda Yarish. Congratulations, come up in a second. So, why, why is this team so large? It's because this flow improvement project, this hydrologic restoration, was done completely in-house, all right? So not this team, with ourselves, we didn't contract any of this. All right, folks, let's go. <laughs> hey, congrats, man. Yeah, good, good. How's it going? How's, how you doing? Hey, good, good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Well, man. Guess, guess back. This doesn't make any sense. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> hey, doing well. Good one. All right. I want to brag about these folks. <laughs> okay. That's right. Yeah, get rid of those stickers. Part of the family here. All right, so uh, what it, why, why is this team so large and why are we recognizing them? So the Taylor Slough Hydrologic Restoration Project was done, like I said, completely in-house. That means our staff designed it. Our staff did the permitting work. Our staff did the Envi Endangered Species Act and the cultural work. Our staff did the survey, uh, did the uh, as-built drawings. Our staff did the construction of this project. None of it was, con maybe a little, I don't know, but most of it was not contracted out uh, because it was done by us. And it was a complex project because we're working in a national park. So there's unique permitting, there's unique protection of the resource. But the Homestead and the Okeechobee field stations did the construction. And if you were at the groundbreaking, I mean the ribbon cutting last week, you knew that they did that construction in four months. That put in 18 new culverts, backfilled nine plugs in the, in the Barrow Canal and removed some spoil mounds to recreate that natural hydrology for Taylor Slough and Florida Bay. It's a project we're very proud of and this team made it happen and made it happen quick. Thank you and congratulations. All right. All right, June Employee of the Month. The June Employee of the Month goes to Tom Wild, right away specialist, supervisor in our field operations division. Now, we all, we all know the importance of right away. Hey, Tom. Uh, we all know the importance of right-of-way uh, because uh, we have a, an amazing amount of infrastructure that we need 
protected. If we need to be able to get our job done, we need to avoid encroachments, we need to manage it exactly right, and our right-of-way program makes sure that happens. And Tom is a supervisor in charge of Fort Lauderdale, West Palm, and Big Cypress Basin right-of-way, and he stays extremely busy. And he does an incredible job. He knows exactly what needs to happen and when it needs to happen. He's always ready to step up. But that's not why he's getting Employee of the Month. He's getting Employee of the Month because he, for a little while, had to do three jobs all at once because we have turnover. Um, and so not only would one person find another opportunity, but a second person did as well or retired or something. So there was Tom like, OK, right away needs to happen. We needed to get our job done. So he spent countless hours on the road, extra hours doing the job, not of just his job, but of three people uh, to get it done. So he's one of those guys that just steps up and deserves to be June Employee of the Month. Congratulations, Tom. Time for our June 2023 Team of the Month, which goes to our Central Everglades Project Planning North Team. That's for Malia Ahmed, uh, Mauricio Gonzalez Betancourt, Srijana, Sh yeah, Srijana Dawadi, Andrea Garcia, Holly Jarvanen, Greg Nolte, Jong Park, Zubayed Rakib, Alexandra Serna, Mark Wilsnack, and Lee Jong Zong. So, so, a few weeks back, a few weeks back, we had, yep, hang on just a sec. We, a few weeks back, we had our groundbreaking to begin SEP North construction. The Central Everglades project uh, is what restores the Everglades, right? I mean, it's all connected, but directly restores the Everglades. And with that groundbreaking and this team stepping up, now we have every single Central Ever Everglades project under construction for the restoration of the Everglades. But it wasn't easy to start this one, right? So when you do planning, you do planning level uh, design, right? And when it, was, it got authorized, ready to go, then this team was tasked with, all right, let's do the actual design, let's make it work. And there were some significant di de, uh, design changes. What this project does, it takes water where it goes now and puts it where it should be, more to the west, northwest part of uh, water, the water conservation area. So this, uh, this team had to do the work, had to get the agreements from the Corps, had to do the modeling to justify it, to switch it up to get the correct nine projects as part of SEP North. That's not just one, nine. So they stepped it up, they did the work, they got the agreements from the Corps, we're still getting some, uh, but it is on its way and we have broken ground and they are team of the month. Thank you, come on. All right, uh, now we're into our service awards. We have a 25-year service award, and our first one to recognize is Dr. Ashi Akpoji, PhD, PE, MBA, Section Leader, Engineering and Construction. Now, Dr. Akpoji, yes. 
going to talk about this. So, Dr. Akpoji, he is also known as Mr. Excellent, uh, because <laughs> Dr. Akpoji will say that every day is an excellent day. I, I love that attitude. Nine, so he came to us in 1998, uh, and he went straight, uh, straight into hard science, engineering. That's right, so engineering and construction. Uh, and he started our culvert flow program, our structure info verification program, and he soon became a lead engineer, and now he's a senior supervising engineer in engineering and construction. But you heard all the letters I said after his name because he's got a lot of education under his belt. Um, he has an MBA and several degrees in civil and water resource engineering, but I want to talk about his research, or at least read about his research. Um, his early research was in hydraulics and groundwater hydrologic modeling using supercomputers and writing algorithms that focused on code optimization to simulate groundwater flow under the uncertainty of the hydrologic conductivity. Pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> As a, poke, as a postdoctorate associate at the University of Florida, he used computer logic and preconditioned conjugate gradient algorithms to solve large million node sparse matrix equations. Pretty impressive. <laughs> That's very important for remediation. <laughs> So uh, clearly, Dr. Ekpoji is, uh, has a brain on him. Uh, he's published in four different journals. Uh, he reviews for three other scientific journals. And he is known for as an expert in desalination. Um, and he was even appointed to the US Desalination Committee, where he's worked on pilot projects in the state of Florida and helped with projects across the US. Um, he is absolutely adored in his area. He's adored for his coffee club, apparently, as well, which I think I need to join. Um, but thank you so much for your 25 years of service, Doctor. <laughs> now we have a 25-year service award, and this goes for this is for Arthur Green, Chemist for Water Quality Bureau, Water Resources Division. <laughs> So um, Arthur joined us in 1998 uh, into our laboratory in our, in our field of chemists. Uh, prior to joining us, he was with the pharmaceutical industry where he worked for 20 years, Ms. Meege. You chemists are can join, to, join together there. Um, but he has been doing data analytical work for the district from the get-go, particularly with total phosphorus. And if you know anything about the South Florida Water Management District, you know we care deeply about total phosphorus. He has been doing this for 25 years. He's, he's analyzed over 500,000 samples of total phosphorus that are all in our data system, available to the public, and get used all the time. We use it all the time. Regulators use it all the time. PhD students use it, academics. It's used around the world because we've got an incredible data set that wouldn't exist without your work. Really appreciate it for your 25 years of service there. Um, he absolutely gets the job done. Another thing he does on the side is he's a Boy Scout troop leader. Bless your heart. I did it for as a den leader, it was enough. Troop leader, <laughs> well, well done. Very proud of everything he does and very proud of his 25 years. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Good. All right. 
All right. Now we have a 30-year service award, and that goes to Jim Lang, Senior Envi Environmental Scientist, Land Stewardship Section, Field Operations. So, wow, you clean up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Jim started in 19, with us in 1993 in our Everglades System Research Division. Um, and if you ask Jim, he will tell you that him and J.K. Rowling's are responsible for saving the Everglades. If you ask him. That might be hyperbole, but, you know, it, he certainly did the foundation work for everything we do with our stormwater treatment areas. Before Jim came to us, Mr. Butler, he ran a dairy operation. And so he brought that experience to us with our, for our dispersed water management and our Smart land management. No way. He's not, you can't you have, him. you can't have him. <laughs> <laughs> but Jim always brings pragmatic solutions. He's not a shy guy. Um, that's an understatement. Uh, but he is very, he's responsible for managing 31,000 acres of our land. Uh, he's got 21 hog removal contracts that he manages. He uh, helps with 21 ag leases uh, in the district. Uh, he's a drone pilot for us in our land management. Jim steps up, right? He's always there to get the job done with passion uh, and a lot of energy. But we're also going to give him a second award, and it's a Good Samaritan Award, along with his recognition for 30 years. Uh, Jim was leaving Dupuy and came across a pretty horrible car accident where someone had crashed into a telephone pole. The telephone pole had snapped in half and fell. Um, and so Jim was first on the scene, Jim being Jim, pulled over, see where he could help. Um, and first he had to check to make sure the power lines weren't causing a danger for anybody that showed up to help or the passenger themselves. The passenger was not well. Um, Jim was able to get, get in and help compress and, and stop some bleeding, administer that first aid. He and another person made sure 911 was called. Uh, he checked for to make sure there weren't any fires, anything like that. But that, those first moments of an accident are so important and Jim was there and didn't hesitate to help. So he is also getting our Good Samaritan Award. The person is recovering. Um, and thank you, Jim, for being there to, to help out with that. Thank you, Jim. Now we have a 35-year service award for James, Mc James Elmore, Land Management Tech, Land Stewardship Section, Land Resources Bureau. James. <laughs> so, James came to us in 1988, uh, and he went right into land management uh, and worked at White Belt Ranch. What's, we, we have a White Belt Ranch? No, we don't. We have Dupuy, because that's what it's called now. And that's where our, our land management was first headquartered, uh, and Jim was a part of that. Uh, and James. Uh, James helped, and so he's been here for 35 years. He's seen the, the bringing on of new projects, new lands, new uh, recreational areas, including Crew, the, uh, the Kissimmee Chain of Lakes, the Kissimmee River Public Use Area. Um, and he is always there to help. But he's got all kinds of skills. Uh, he's adept with uh, heavy equipment operation. And when you're in land management doing heavy equipment operation, sometimes it's very delicate work. And you got to do it just right, because we have sensitive species, sensitive uh, ecosystems. And you can't just roll in there uh, willy-nilly. you got to do it exactly right. And James is really good at that. Uh, he's one of our uh, lead prescribed burn uh, implementers, uh, tricky business. Uh, he knows how to get the job done and know how to, knows how to get it sa done safely in order to make sure that our ecosystem is, is you know, 
maintained as it should be, as nature intended. Uh, he's got, he's always ready to step up. Um, and you're not ready for retirement yet, 35 years? Good, <laughs> stick around. No, I'm gonna stay a while. Oh, good deal. I'll be here for your 45 year recognition. <laughs> but apparently uh, James is known for his mouth-watering barbecue. He loves to fish and when he retires, that's what he's gonna do all the time. Thank you for your 35 years. All right, another 35 year service award, and that is for Randy Van Zee, Systems Data Modeler Architect, Hydrology and Hydraulics. Randy. <laughs> So Randy came to us uh, in 1988, and he was basically a modeling architect. Uh, and he had a modeling career with the district, and you know how much we rely on our modelers. But uh, he ended it, he did just retire, right? <laughs> Congratulations on your retirement. Uh, I don't like that. Um, <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, but he, he ended, he finished up with the Water Management District as a chief modeler. But, what he's known for is being an architect of the RSM, the Regional Simulation Model. The Regional Simulation Model, if you don't know, is a worldwide known model specifically crafted for South Florida that underpins almost everything we do. Um, it, it underpins congressionally authorized projects, right? So it was part of the Central Everglades Planning Project, the Regional Simulation Model. The uh, Western Everglades Restoration, Regional Simulation, Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration, Biscayne Bay and Southern Everglades Restoration, all being run at the re with the Regional Simulation Model. And it, that we use it for operations. LOSUM is being built with the Regional Simulation Model. Uh, the Combined Operating Pan, sending more water to Everglades National Park, the Regional Simulation Model. The EAA Reservoir, the Regional Simulation Model was used. I mean, a lot of this wouldn't have happened without your work. Um, so really appreciate your 35 years of service. If you want to come back, you're welcome. Thank you. All right, that was the, we're done with employee recognitions, but before we wrap up, we do have a special award presentation. I'd like to call up David Minette and Mike Hill from the Wounded Warrior Project, David Hunt from the Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Services, Operation Outdoor Freedom, and our friend Newton Cook. Thank you, Mr. Bartlett. Appreciate everything you and Dee have done, or Miss Bird have done to make this possible today. Thank you. Um, uh, as you can see, I'm, uh, I used to work for the United States Army. That was a long time ago. Uh, several people say that I, I went on active duty back when Noah signed on. But uh, I spent 26 years on active duty, retired in 1995, and then I got recalled in 2005 served another four or five years and retired again in 2010 after my final tour in Afghanistan. After I retired, though, it was my great honor and privilege to meet David Hunt, 
Shortly after he was selected, David, uh, shortly after he was selected uh, by Adam Putnam to put together an organization called Operation Outdoor Freedom. And uh, this is an extraordinary organization, and uh, I've been honored to be a part of it from the beginning. But, um, you know, he put it together. He, it served 5,000 of my fellow brothers and sisters since its inception, and uh, it's doing a great deal of good for reducing the trauma that so many of these uh, uh, veterans have, have been put to and are recovering from. We also have uh, Mr. David, uh, David Manette. David works uh, with Wounded Warrior uh, Program. And uh, David, uh, I'm talking out of school. You'll notice if you talk to him, he's not from Alabama, okay? He's a, he's a native of the UK. And he used to work on the Britannia, uh, which was the Queen's uh, ship. Uh, and he used to drive her all over the world. And when he finally decided to leave that position, they retired the Britannia, okay? So, you know, he had a, a very important position there. And finally, we've got uh, Mario Cicado, who is a former Marine. Actually, he was gonna do the presentation today, but we couldn't stuff him back into his uniform. But uh, anyway, I'd like everybody, if they would, to please take a seat. I do get a little long-winded every now and then, so. I'll call everybody up here in a minute for the presentations, but I don't want to have you all standing around while I go through this. So if you would, take a seat, and I'll call you down as, as we get to you. Go ahead, guys. Uh, Mr. Newton took, uh, Cook initially proposed the idea of conducting joint United Waterfowler and OOFSTA hunts for disabled veterans. He said the UW or the United Waterfowlers would volunteer to recruit guides and provide the boats, kayaks, and canoes, but they needed a partner with another organization with deeper pockets to cover the expense of the food, lodging, and the participating vets. So the objective of the original partnership was to obtain additional funding and administrative support for the hunts. Since OOF is a state-funded program, that com comes under the jurisdiction of the Florida Forest Service and the Commission of Agriculture, OOF definitely had deeper funding pockets than the United Waterfowlers, which is a nonprofit. It turned out to be a good marriage because it enabled OOF to provide duck hunts to the hunting, fishing, and other outdoor experiences they had already provided to over 5,000 of Florida's disabled vets. Mr. Manette and the Dump Wounded Warrior Project became partners with OOF and the United Waterfowlers when we ran into funding issues during the COVID crisis. As a matter of fact, uh, it looked like we were only gonna be able to have uh, one vet per room, which would cut down the number of participants from about 40 to 20, and uh, we wouldn't be able to afford any of the food. So uh, Mr. Manette came on board and said, okay, we can, we can cover that expense for you and we'll partner with you as long as we can provide some of our wounded warrior participants. Um, so David Hunt, David Manette, Newton Cook, and I are here today to do something that's long overdue. We're here to make a presentation to our most important partner in this effort, the Swift Mud Governing Board and the key staffers who have made these hunts possible. We wanted to recognize your chairman, Mr. Chauncey Goss, and we also requested that we be allowed to thank each of the other SWIFT board members, governing members, as well as the selected key staff members who have moved heaven and earth to make it possible for us to conduct the joint annual duck hunts for our disabled vets every year for the past seven years. <clears throat> David, could you come forward? Mr. Chauncey Goss, we have a, uh, a presentation that uh, my brothers and sister wounded warrior veterans have asked us to make to personally thank you on behalf, on their behalf, for making these extraordinary hunting opportunities available to them. <clears throat> Thanks to you, we've always we have formed a partnership which now serves as the benchmark for all future OOF and Wounded Warrior Project programs, not just here in Florida, but nationwide. A 
Okay, that said, it's now time to uh, move on to the next phase of it. But before we go to that, I want, to, I want to make you familiar with what a challenge coin is and what it represents. I'm here to tell you it's really a big deal. We're going to be presenting this today to each of the board members and to the selected staff members who made all of these uh, hunts possible for the past seven years. <clears throat> Uh, each challenge coin bears the organization's unique insignia and an inspirational message. They are presented by the organization in recognition of outstanding individual contributions and to enhance unit morale. Historically, challenge coins are presented for special achievement to either a member of the unit or to non-members for exceptional support. Once awarded, the recipients are expected to keep the challenge coin in his or her possession at all times. Why? Because a challenge which is sometimes referred to as a challenge co a check, can be made at any time. A coin check is initiated by taking the coin in your hand and raising it above your head and declaring <laughs> coin check. And when you slap that coin down on the bar table, everyone present is required to present their own challenge coin and slap it down as well. Anyone who's previously been given a coin who, a coin who fails to produce it is obligated to buy a drink. Okay? not only for the challenger, but also for everyone else who has answered the challenge. And believe me, I know from personal experience, if there's a coin challenge and you're caught short without a challenge coin, it can get very expensive. So just keep that in mind. So now that you understand what a challenge coin is, what it signifies, and the coin check protocol, I'm going to ask each of today's recipients to prepare to receive your Wounded Warrior Project challenge coins. If you'd come down forward, we'll present each of you individual. I call out your names. As you do, though, I'd like to point out Mr. Ron Bergeron. Uh, my son was a uh, CB in the Navy, and their motto was can do. And I don't know if Mr. Bergeron was ever in the Navy, but he definitely lives up to the can do motto. Two years ago, we wanted to do our duck hunts, and they said we couldn't do it because they were busy repairing all the levees. But we found out Mr. Bergeron was repairing them. We brought it to him in true Cajun fashion. He said, you're going to hunt there this year. And uh, we had the best hunt we've ever had. Thank you, Mr. Bergeron. <laughs> yes. Could we have all the committee members come down forward here, and also any of the staffers that were part of this? I think we've got, uh... OK, yeah. We've got uh, Drew Bartlett, Rory Feeney, James Harbaugh, Dan Cotter, and Michael Cheek. <clears throat> we'll present each as I call them out. Your chairman, Mr. Chauncey Goss. Uh, the vice chairman, Scott Wagner. Mr. Ron Bergeron. Ken Butler. Charlie Martinez, and Jackie Lip Lippish. We'll also give three coins to the three board members who are attending by Zoom, Cheryl Meads, Charlotte Roman, and Jay Steinley. I've given those to Ms. Bird, and she'll present them later. Um, and also, we'd like to recognize the people on the staff who made this all possible. I used to be a staff member. I know how it works. You guys work down in the bowels of the building, but you make it happen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bartlett, Rory Feeney, James Harbaugh, Dan Cotter, Michael Cheek. Uh, before I do that, on behalf of the Wounded Warrior Project and the OOF Disabled Veteran Participants you've reached out to, touched, and never forgotten, I salute you. Thank you.
All right, before you leave, just let me finish up here if I could. I'm a little long-winded, I know it, that's one of my faults, but uh, take a look at the front side of your coins, if you would. Uh, on it is inscribed the Wounded Warrior Project motto, the greatest casualty is being forgotten. Thank you for always remembering our disabled vets' sacrifices, for always having their backs, and for honoring and empowering them. But above all else, thank you for being there when they needed you most. Now I have one final request before I'm done today. Would you all please stand and join me in a round of applause for these great Americans? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, guys. Well, thank you very much for that, and uh, what an inspirational morning between our, our employees and the Wounded Warriors um, and OFF. Thanks very much. Um, Rosie, we're going to go to the next um, item on the agenda and look at revisions. I'm sorry if I caught you off guard there. Can I say one? Chairman, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bergeron, go ahead. I'm sorry. Let me, Rosie, before you go, let me recognize Mr. Bergeron. Yeah, I, I just want to... Just want to thank our our board and and all of uh, the leadership of South Florida Water Management for the policies of letting the public have sustainable access and enjoyment. It's a fine example of of all of the lands that we manage and be able to help the wounded warriors. The wounded warriors, as well as all the rest of the public, that enjoys our public land in a sustainable way, from the bikers and the hikers and the bird watchers, and so I want to congratulate our staff and my fellow board members for having these kind of policies. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Bergeron, and I, I think when you say our public land, the, the key there is the public because it, it belongs to the public. We're, we're just taking care of it. Uh, uh, Rosie, now we'll go to agenda revisions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Consent agenda items 17 and 18 are postponed. Thank you. We're gonna go to abstentions by board members. I'm gonna poll each board member. Uh, I'm gonna start with Mr. Bergeron. Do you have any abstentions? No. Thank you, Mr. Thrillipich. No. I have none. Vice Chair? None. Uh, Mr. Martinez? None. Mr. Butler? I have none. Uh, Mr. Steinley, if you're on? I have none. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Meads? None. And uh, uh, Colonel Roman? I have none. Great, thanks. <coughs> we'll move now to the uh, approval of the minutes of the May 11th, 2023 meeting. Does anyone have any changes to the minutes? Um, hearing none, could I have a motion? I'll make a motion. I'll second it. I have a motion and a second. I'm going to call that question. If there's no further discussion, <coughs> seeing none, uh, Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Mr. Olipich? Yes. I'm going to vote yes, Vice Chair? Yes. Mr. Martinez? Yes. Mr. Butler? Yes. Um, Mr. Steinley? Yes. Ms. Meads? Yes. And Colonel Roman? Yes. Thank you. That passes unanimously. And we will move to the Executive Director's Report, Mr. Bartlett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, here we are back in West Palm Beach, um, and it's very important that we take uh, board meetings on the road, uh, but I really wanted to acknowledge and thank Rosie Bird, Molly Brown, Yvette Bonilla, Angie Fretwell, Dwayne Piper, Jared Revo, and Juanita Bozeman for all the work they did to make it possible for us to have a board meeting um, away from West Palm Beach because they're very important. 
Uh, you may notice there's a new face at our little rotunda here. We have Lucene Dadrian, who is uh, uh, the new division director for engineering construction and modeling uh, that we hired recently. And I just want to welcome her to the leadership team. Thank you, Lucene. Um, speaking of engineering and construction, um, the C43 project, I wanted to give you an update. Uh, we do continue construction of the C43 reservoir. We have 20 subcontractors working on site with 150 employees continuing the construction of the reservoir. At this point, all the critical embankment and structure work has been picked up and continues construction with the exception of the placement of the soil cement on the interior of the embankment. That's a much larger contract. We're getting quotes from companies uh, to, to then bring them on board uh, to start that work as well. Um, we expect those quotes in the next couple of weeks, and then we'll be able to hire a good uh, best value contractor to start the placement of the soil cement, uh, and then we'll be, uh, be completely up and running uh, in addition to all the structures and the embankment work that's getting done. So it's still under construction, folks. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Mary Cruz to give a legal update with respect to the C43 project. Good morning, Governing Board members. As Drew stated, I'm gonna give you an update on the cases that we have against the C43 Water Management Builders Joint Venture. And because those are a lot of words, I'm just gonna to refer to them as contractors or the contractor. So as you may recall, um, five days after we terminated the contractor for default, they filed a federal lawsuit against us alleging wrongful termination. It's the district's position that the federal court lacked the jurisdiction to hear the case. So through our attorney, Robert Glass, we filed a motion to dismiss, asking the federal court to dismiss the complaint for lack of jurisdiction. And it was a very compelling motion to dismiss. <laughs> and I say it was compelling because as of yesterday, the attorney for the contractor voluntarily dismissed their complaint in federal court, meaning they withdrew their complaint. So we have no active complaints against us in federal court. As we were dealing with that federal court complaint, we were simultaneously assisting our outside counsel, who represents us, in preparing a state court complaint against the contractor for their breach. That complaint was filed on May 19th, and it lays out all the repeated delays the district's effort to work with the contractor, the cure notices deficiencies, and the deficiencies in the contractor's claims that they alleged in the federal complaint. The, um, it is expected that the counsel for the contractor will file a response on or before June 26 to our complaint. The complaint also, I'll add, also seeks to recover damages from the contractor for the breach of contract. And those are all the updates I have now on the litigation. I'll continue to inform you as things progress. And if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to contact me. Thanks. Thank you, Mary Cruz. Um, in other news, uh, the governor did sign House Bill 1379, and that is the bill uh, that was run in response to the governor's executive order 2308 to execute Achieving Even More Now. <clears throat> and it was really a kind of a DEP, Department of Environmental Protection bill. But a number of things it did, which is very exciting, is it dedicated 100 million per year for the brand new Indian River Lagoon Protection Program. It strengthened the bead maps with additional requirements for projects and coordination to see improvements in water quality. It expanded the wastewater grant program to include two ni new, new types of projects, stormwater projects, like, like we do, on, and agriculture projects to improve waters that aren't meeting water quality standards. It prioritizes sewer connections uh, for those septic to sewer needs, when we have too many septic tanks where they shouldn't be. So it prioritized sewer connections for not only existing developments, but new developments to make sure we don't make things worse. It also includes local governments to include water quality projects as part of their comprehensive planning uh, efforts. Um, it requires advanced wastewater treatment for treatment plants that discharge to nutrient impaired water waterways, and it dedicates $100 million annually to Florida Forever with an emphasis on the wildlife corridor. A lot of good things in that bill, and, and we're happy that it was passed. 
Um, one thing I wanted to update you is um, every month, almost every month, on our consent agenda, we have a sale of a real estate asset, something that, that the original flood control district had, which was like a reservation for a road or a canal on property uh, that over the time frames we've learned we don't really need. Uh, and so the, the underlying fee owners for those areas um, need to clear up their title. They come to us and they say, hey, can you sell those reservations to us? Um, and if we don't need them, we'll keep them if we need them or think we might need them. But if we don't need them, then we will sell them. And I know every time you're voting on that consent agenda, it's like, what's happening to this money? Where is it going? And until this month, it was really kind of going into the big pot for use uh, in budgeting. But we have implemented a policy shift uh, to dedicate. So we're selling a real estate asset. Let's take that uh, revenue and put it back into our real estate assets. And so all the funds that are generated from those sales are now going into taking care of our recreational areas, upgrading where it needs to, making sure we have safe, good facilities in those recreational areas. I get budget requests from that program uh, you know, yearly to update a boardwalk, replace a bathroom, things like that, a shelter, um, kiosks. Um, and those fit within the budget sort of dollars that we're getting when we're selling these real estate assets. So that's a new policy we're implementing so that you know exactly where those funds are going uh, in the water management district. <clears throat> if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Um, at any time. Um, Mr. Bergeron joined us at the, when the governor announced the registration opening for the annual Python Challenge. Uh, the Python Challenge is August 4th through 13th, and if you're interested in uh, joining that challenge, it's floridapythonchallenge.org. Go there and you can register. Last year we removed 231 pythons. We had participants from 31 states. Uh, and, and other countries as well. So it was, um, uh, it's a great awareness campaign. It removes pythons and it's, a, it's an event that always gets very, a lot of recognition around the country. So that was kicked off uh, last week or the week before last. Um, I want to give you an update on the Lake Okeechobee System <coughs> Operating Manual. So the, um, so as you know, the LOSUM uh, is not going to get finalized until December, um, but that doesn't mean the Corps has stopped working on LOSUM. Uh, they are, they've been working on updating the language of the water control plan and the environmental impact statement um, and, and trying to address all the comments they received on the previous draft, um, including district comments. So what I'm told is that they plan to release another draft of LOSUM later this month so the public can see how it's been updated. Uh, don't expect any major changes to the structure. Um, the, what you've seen, what we've been working on that created that balance uh, throughout this process isn't changing. Uh, what we're really seeing is sort of the words around the implementation of those. So later this month, of course, planning on releasing another draft of that uh, for all of us to look at. Um, and lastly, while I'm on Lake Okeechobee, um, as we know, the lake is a bit high right now. I know that will be covered in our conditions reports. Um, and we knew it wouldn't be this high if we had storage uh, north and south of the lake already built, and the governor, the governor certainly challenged us to expedite that storage. Uh, one of the components is the above ground storage north of Lake Okeechobee, and so as you know, we have picked up the uh, Lake Okeechobee Component A restoration project. Um, LOCAR is the new acronym to get used to, uh, but we kicked that, that planning process off in, in April, uh, they've been doing alternatives analysis and modeling on those alternatives that were presented in April. Um, and that is coming together as expected. We're going to see some benefits. You got northern storage. It's going to be able to control those high lake levels a lot better. Um, certainly would, be, would have been useful this year. Um, so I look forward to us presenting that. We're looking at scheduling a public a rollout of that analysis in early July uh, for everyone to see. So. That, moves, that is still moving along on schedule for us to position um, that for authorization in 2024. And that's what I have for you today, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Mr. Bartlett. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Mr. Bartlett? Mr. Bergeron. Well, I want to uh, thank our Python team and the FWC. Uh, what a great job they're doing. 
moving thousands and thousands of snakes out of our environment. Can you imagine the Everglades with no wildlife? So really want to congratulate our, <coughs> our staff and you, Drew, for participating in this challenge, which was started 10 years ago. Um, and I think it's extremely successful and it's really an environmental hunt, bringing in the public to help us and educating, you, you know, the, the hikers, the bikers, uh, the fishermen, the hunters that are in this environment because it's all about we together. It's quite a challenge to remove this invasive snake that can destroy our total food chain. So just want to thank our staff and the FWC. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Bertrand. Anyone else? Great. We're going to move now to our first public comment period. Uh, if you're here to comment on a specific agenda item, we ask you to hold your comment until we reach that uh, item on our agenda. This comment period is for general comments, not related to agenda items, and we appreciate your help in running an efficient meeting. Public comment for consent agenda item is item 12 on the agenda, and public comment for two discussion agenda items will be heard after each presentation um, when we get to that point. The public uh, had an opportunity to provide written comments prior to this meeting. We did not receive any e-comment. Are there any general public comments? There is, Mr. Chairman. In person, we have Newton Cook. Good morning, Newton Cook, United Water Followers of Florida. Uh, first, I want to, well, thank you very much for the Wounded Warrior. Those guys are really something else. And you should see the ones that we bring in and, and, and get them out there. Some of them never duck hunted before. And it's an exciting morning, and it takes two of us for every one of them, basically, to make it go. So thanks for, for reckoning having them here. Uh, Part of that is recreation. On June 19th, we'll be right here in this room, uh, Monday night, five, uh, Monday afternoon, 5 o'clock, uh, for the recreation uh, meeting. Uh, we have uh, the Florida Paddling Trail Association, which is the first time we've had a, the stakeholder do, and they have tremendous paddling trails uh, in the district, and we're going to learn about all that. We also have Ducks Unlimited coming, which is a big, big deal to have the biologists for Ducks Unlimited come here. They're spending millions of dollars right now inside the district, uh, and he's going to list and show us all the money they're spending inside the district. Uh, and, of course, uh, the FWC will rep be reporting on the STAs, which is always a duck hunting and gator hunting uh, venue. <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm here again about Lake Okeechobee. The proposal by the core, Lowsome, is a disaster for the heart of the Everglades. It's a disaster. If Lowsome had been in effect, and basically it has been for the last six months, the lake would be exactly where it is today, 14 feet, which is a foot too high. It's only going to take one storm, and all hell is going to break loose in the estuaries, just one. And we just started the rainy season. 14 feet is too high, and yet Lowsom is designed to keep the lake high too long, too often, and it destroys the vegetation in the lake. The lake today is a mud hole. If you were up at the 16-county coalition meeting the other day, the gentleman had been out there for 40 years, explained it looked like this podium. Now, there's good places on the lake back behind the marshes, but most of the lake is a soup. Why in the world are we putting out a plan that the Corps even says is not good for the ecology of the lake? Why are we destroying the heart of the Everglades? Makes no sense. The dirty algae-filled water that's in that lake and will be in that lake more and more and more as you keep it too high, too long, too often, where do you think it's going to go? It's going to go to the St. Lucie dirtier than they've ever had. It's going to go to the Catalusahatchee, dirtier than they've ever had. It's going to go to the Everglades, dirtier than it's ever been. And we're going to put that loathsome into effect. We need a NEPA on the snail kite on Lake Okeechobee. 
It's got to destroy. That's an endangered species, incidentally. And we got a NEPA on the turtle on the West Coast. What we're interested in is the snail kites on Lake Okeechobee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Moving to our virtual participants, we have Nyla Pipes. Ms. Pipes, you recognize to speak? Good morning, sound check? We hear you, Ms. Pipes. Thank you. Nyla Pipes, One Florida Foundation. I also want to talk about the fact that Lake Okeechobee is too high, sitting at 14 feet this morning as we head into the rainy season. Mr. Cook is absolutely right. One storm and our estuaries are going to be bombarded with big slugs of water and there is a growing algal bloom already on the lake as we knew there would be post Hurricane Ian. This isn't a good situation and it's a situation we're setting ourselves up for year after year with Lowson. A lot of people right now want to point to the fact that we have good bass fishing. That's great. But what people are not talking about the fact is, is the fact that the bass are all concentrated in what little good quality habitat we have left on Lake Okeechobee right now. It's literally like shooting fish in a barrel out there. Yeah, we're still catching big bass, but that's because they've all found the place that they can still survive. So we need to be real about this conversation. This high lake level this time of year is not a good situation for the lake or our estuaries. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pipes. Next, we have Mark Perry. Mr. Perry, you're recognized to speak. Uh, thank you, Governing Board. Um, hope you can hear me okay. Uh, echoing a, a lot of the highness of Lake Okeechobee, we should have been kind of sending more water south during the dry season. Unfortunately, the STAs have been, you know, damaged and were not operational, so we couldn't move a lot of water south. But we need to fix that and remedy that for future operations, particularly when Lowson comes on. Um, I'm here just to kind of recognize that today is uh, World Ocean Day and June is World Ocean Month. Uh, we're trying to recognize the oceans as our life-sustaining system, ecosystem on this uh, planet. And what we do on land obviously affects everything and particularly under flood control. And I could go into a lot of statistics about the pollution in our ocean and what's the problem being caused. But since 1970, our ocean temperatures have risen a degree, which doesn't sound like much, but it's caused coral bleaching. But it also, the ocean absorbs about 90% of all the heat in our atmosphere. So we're, uh, by thermal expansion, you're recognizing sea level rise. And sea level rise is, is caused uh, over eight inches in the, since 1950, as, as really causing a rate of increase that, that you all as the district have to deal with, particularly in the structures and the flood control, flood protection structures. The other things that happen, of course, are, you know, our carbon emissions and things that are, we have to decrease because we're increasing the ocean acidification. The carbon dioxide can only be absorbed so much and the ocean's producing carbonic acid and that's causing a real problem uh, throughout. And of course, plastics over 65 million pounds a day of ocean plastics get put into the, our ocean environment. And besides beach cleanups and everything we need to do is we need to get that pollution stopped. And as you all under flood control and drainage too for our watersheds, um, providing a lot of that drainage also has that runoff, basin runoff going into, from the watersheds into uh, the Atlantic or Gulf of Mexico along our ocean coastal environments. This causes a lot of issues with loading of nutrients and suspended solids that covers over coral reefs and causes a lot of issues up and down the coast, of course, uh, with nutrient pollution, including algae blooms and other things. So we need to curtail that pollution up in the watershed and stop it as best we can. So under flood control and drainage, and as we discuss that today, let's remember the world oceans are at risk here, both in the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean for what we do and how we manage our water and flood control uh, in this situation. Thank you for all you do. Take care. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Mr. Chairman, I have no more raised hands for this item. 
Uh, thank you. Thanks very much for your comments, everyone. Um, we're going to move now to board comment, and I'll start to my left. Mr. Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't have much this morning. Um, you know, I want to uh, want to recognize the comments of, uh, you know, we'll talk about it later, but where LACO is at today. And, um, you know, one of the things that I want to be sure and challenge Mitnick and, and the rest of our staff, Lawrence, is make sure we are maximizing the use of all the tools we have at hand as we go into the rainy season and capturing the first flush and all the nutrients that we see, the, the, the spike that we see within first flush. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be going into a new dynamic uh, than where we've been at last 15 years with some higher lake levels. And, you know, there's always going to be these water supply concern issues. But as high as that lake is right now, um, and I know some of our operational criteria that was built into how these things run uh, doesn't necessarily allow us to capture that first flush and I just challenge us to push the envelope on that and capture that first flush and let's keep these nutrients from going into the lake keeping them into these projects these public projects that we have um, the only other thing I want to thank uh, 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 thank the wounded warrior project team our staff that uh, uh, staff and those that before us that helped to initiate that with the water management district and uh, in our current staff and um, thank y'all and for for continuing that project my goodness when the more I learned about it the more it's that is a project that, that needs priority when it comes to recreation on district lands and uh, Newton I thank you for advocating and uh, thank you for uh, for for constantly updating us on where that's at look forward to hear more on your uh, rack rec meeting on the 19th uh, that's all I have today mr. chairman Thanks, Mr. Butler. Mr. Martinez. Thanks, uh, Vice Chair. Nothing from the County of Miami-Dade. <laughs> I'm glad all is going so well down there. <laughs> Mr. Olipich. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to say it's great to see everybody uh, remotely or here in person. And second, I would like to introduce someone who is uh, the most important person in my life, my husband, who came with me today. Ed, would you stand up just for a second? He hates this. He hates this. So um, Ed had never been down here to uh, headquarters, and uh, I thought it would be a good time for him to come. And I know he's going to hate this too. But um, he was gone for six weeks, and he walked the Camino uh, between the south of France and Spain, uh, 500 miles, and as soon as he got home the next day, I was like, welcome home. Could you please get in the airplane and get some pictures? <laughs> and so he got up in the airplane and took some very valuable uh, aerial photographs, um, of which I submitted to the um, Army Corps of Engineers and executive staff for the periodic scientist call. Um, as we know, it's been very um, helpful to have DEP and the Army Corps um, putting out the report through Josh Rowe <clears throat> every day about the uh, algae situation in front of the gates throughout the system. Uh, but it's definitely also helpful to have um, people like my husband, and there have been others that have been flying over the lake since 2013, really, uh, documenting and, and helping understand where we are with these algae blooms. And as much as it is an absolute um, unnerving situation when you see the algae like that, what I have to say is someone who's been around for a long time doing this, and I know there are many others too, is that I think we're in a really good place in that we know where we are. In the past, 2013, we did not know where we were. We did not know what might be coming through those gates. The district was not being transparent at that time, in my opinion. When uh, Governor DeSantis changed out the board, there was an emphasis on the blue-green algae. Look at all of the testing we're doing, all of the money going into improving testing, reporting, operations, continuing. Yes, we are still kind of in a tough position, and yes, the lake is high, 
but we are in a better position than we have been in before because we know what's going on. And I am grateful to the district and the Army Corps and the public, like my husband, uh, for, for helping with that. Um, on, on just another topic, uh, right after the last meeting, um, I met with Mark Perry and Florida Oceanographic and uh, Drew and Mr. Mitnick, and uh, we met at the C-44 Reservoir, which is also not totally under operations yet because they're you know, working on the seepage there, but it's still incredibly impressive to be out there and see all of that in the STAs. Um, but Mr. Perry and Florida Oceanographic have the right to be concerned about the stormwater treatment situation. And I know people sometimes get tired of hearing about it, but you're always going to hear about it because it's such a big component. It's such a major, in their white paper, it says that 2.2 billion to build and 22 million annually. I don't know if that's exactly right, but it's probably pretty close. And we all know that in 2027, um, I have a chart here, um, the agriculture side of it will no longer, their, their, their payments into the system will start going down because that's part of, that, that was a legislative decision years ago. So we've got expenses going up. We have the situation with the lake. People on the coast put in a lot of money and they want the protections of the STAs too. They want more going through those stormwater treatment areas um, until the EAA reservoir is done. So this pressure is not going to go away. I appreciated um, Mr. Bartlett and Mr. Mitnett having a hard conversation with um, uh, Mark Perry. It's not like there was any great um, answer to it, but I think it's just like the algae. We have to keep talking about it. We have to be transparent about it. We can't just put it under the carpet and think it's going to go away. The more that we talk about it, the more that we're in a position to deal with it. So um, thank you to staff, and uh, I look forward to today's meeting. And thank you to my husband for, for being here today. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Mr. Lipich, and welcome, Dr. Lipich. Mr. Bergeron? I just want to say again, uh, I want to thank our staff for the, uh, and all of our uh, team working on the Python removal. I want to thank all the stakeholders, and I think there were about 32 states that participated from 32 different states uh, to remove this invasive snake out of our environment. Um, and I also want to thank the wounded warriors, <clears throat> and I want to thank especially Newton Cook, which uh, has brought with all of our staff the recreational opportunities uh, dedicating his life to uh, all the stakeholders from the hikers and the bikers, the duck hunters and whatever. So I want to thank you, Newton, for that. I do, I do have concerns about the high water in Lake Okeechobee and uh, in the central Everglades and 2A, uh, which I'll talk about when we get to our condition report and uh, on an update on moving water south. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Bergeron. Uh, Mr. Steinle? Thanks, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you guys for accommodating me uh, virtually. I won't, I won't say a lot because I know it can be slightly disruptive coming through the speakers from there, um, but I just wanted to let the, the, the rest of my board members know about um, uh, two visits, site visits I had. Um, this was after, uh, the first one was after the uh, groundbreaking for SEP North, which in and of itself was an incredibly exciting milestone. Um, but uh, Rory and team, uh, who I thank uh, greatly, uh, gave me an invasive vegetation management tour. I got a great perspective uh, from the air uh, of the enormous task that we have controlling exotics. Um, in the water conservation areas uh, in the STAs. Um, and obviously, you know, we talked a lot about and saw 
um, efforts focused on min minimizing our herbicide use when it is possible and uh, prioritizing biological and mechanical treatment. But, you know, it's just, uh, I'm glad I did it because it's a constant, it's a reminder to me that it's a constant battle that's not going away. Even once it is treated, once this vegetation is treated, it requires maintenance to not reappear. Um, so it continues to require significant uh, commitment by the district uh, and other agencies and, um, and is expensive, but I'm, I'm, um, I'm proud of what the team's doing and thank them for that tour and their work. The second um, component of that was a, a tour of STA one, uh, where there's also massive es efforts there uh, on vegetation management um, so that we can treat obviously the QBEL standards. The reminder there to me was that the SDAs were originally purposed to 50 to, to, to treating to 50 parts per billion. We all know we need to get down to 12. Uh, and that's the purpose, obviously, of restoration strategies. So uh, we are doing a lot of work, expansions, improvements, et cetera. Um, but it's always a helpful reminder to me um, that that's not what these um, man-made wetlands were, were built to spec uh, and we're adjusting them uh, to the best uh, of our ability. Uh, the second tour, so that was the second component of the first tour. The second tour, I want to thank um, Palm Beach Aggregates. I had a chance to tour the LA and FEB, which obviously is part of the STA1 infrastructure. Uh, and then I also, since it's right there in the north, had a chance to see the new C51 reservoir uh, in phase one, which is about to be uh, flooded. Uh, and so that will relieve, it's the, that, that storage is contracted out to uh, municipal water supply. Um, but it will relieve some flow um, to Lagoon, to the Lake Worth Lagoon from Basin. Phase two, and I should have this information in front of me, but I, I think I remember is much larger than phase one. There, as you guys have heard, are um, uh, discussions about uh, how that will use, be used as future storage uh, and significantly provide some relief to, to to uh, C51 releases to the lagoon. So both really helpful tours. And um, I just, uh, I'll just end uh, on thanking Drew for the great idea and now new policy of using um, the release of reservation funds uh, to, to, to plow back into those lands uh, and just continue uh, to provide access and improved um, use of, uh, of public lands. So thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Steinle. Uh, Ms. Meads. Hi, I'm sorry I'm not there today. I'm away on uh, family business. Uh, I am glad to join you by Zoom. I only have a short public comment. I wanted to encourage uh, you all to take a look at the Miami Herald this morning. Uh, back in April, we talked about the Florida Aqueduct, Florida Keys Aqueduct Authority. And um, there is an article there today. Apparently, not only do they manage clean water, but they also have a uh, sewage function there in Monroe County. And the article said that 200 gallons of sewage quietly leaked into the Florida Keys. Um, this is mostly at Ramrod Key, about 23 miles northeast of Key West. And I don't know about you guys, but if you love the Florida Bay like I do, I read a story like this and it just breaks my heart. Uh, the great new, this facility that they're talking about was built in 2017, the sewage wastewater uh, uh, facility, 2017. It cost a billion dollars. Um, and it, uh, the good news out of this story is that the uh, Florida Department of Environmental Protection is uh, watching and managing uh, the recovery of this. So I wanted to encourage you, if you care about the Bay, to uh, read that article in today's Miami Herald. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Meads. Colonel Roman. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll save my comments for later. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Colonel. Um, a couple comments. I um, want to thank, thank the staff um, 
very much for working with the Wounded Warrior Team. I think that, and thank also Colonel Hill, uh, Mr. Manette, and uh, Mr. Hunt, and of course Mr. Cook for making that happen. I think it's 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 a it's such an important program, and I think it really does change lives. And I'm really proud to be part of it. And it was nice of them to recognize us today. And it, honestly, it's the staff they should be recognizing, not us. So th thank you all. Uh, it is flood month. Um, the irony isn't lost on me that as chairman of the governing board, I'm probably the only person up here who's lost everything I have to a flood. But that was because of storm surge, not rainfall. But it, but it does put a point on the fact to me that you know, what we do is really important because you know, going through these things is really difficult and avoiding them and keeping them from happening is what this district is all about. And I, I just want to thank everyone who does that every single day in uh, protecting all the property and lives out there. Um, it, SEP North was a great, great um, day. Um, Mr. Steinle did a fantastic job there. Uh, Taylor Slew. Same thing, the district staff's obviously been hard at work over the last month. I um, want to thank Governor DeSantis for HB, HB uh, 1379. Um, that, that really does help us out. Um, money and direction are two things we need, and I uh, th want to thank him, thank the legislature for that, and, and also our friends at uh, DEP. Um, the lake is definitely higher than most of us want it right now, um, which puts a real exclamation point on something to me, which is something Drew alluded to, which is we really need to finish our storage projects. And we, we got to keep working on them with urgency. And I think we, I think we are. I think this agency is. And I, I look at what happened at Taylor Slough, and I, I know things can happen quickly when we cooperate, when we coordinate, when we work together with our 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 partner agencies, and I just, I want everyone, I know this agency is good at that, and I want to I want to stay focused on that, because I think if we do that, we can finish these things even more quickly than, than advertised, and just, we have to keep pushing, because we got to keep the, the, our foot on the gas, so the storage is, is the answer to all of this, so I, I want to thank our staff for doing that, I want to encourage our, our sister agency staffs to, to keep working on this stuff, because it's really important to the residents of South Florida. Um, we're going to go now to um, consent. Are there any public comments on consent? Or actually, any board member want to move anything from consent to discussion? Any public comment on consent? We do, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Rosie. Lorraine Capone. Commenting on um, item number 15, I'd just like to point out, I did notice in the bid, I had sent Ms. Bird some handouts on this. This bid was let with hourly rates as well as an on-site and an off-site rate. If there's any way you can um, display that, uh, the, the thing I sent you. I haven't received anything from you. I'm um, looking at my inbox now and I don't have anything. Okay, right well, I'll explain it to you. I sent it to Mr. Butler. It had three scenarios. It had an A on-site um, component, it had a B off-site component, and then it had hourly rates. This bid was um, awarded based on A, which is an on-site rate. And I had asked staff and I had asked Mr. Uh, Bartlett to return my phone call, but I couldn't get one. Um, to discuss this because I did think that this is not in the best interest of the taxpayers to allow this to be let go this way because this on-site rate is never going to be realized. What you're going to have, this is going to be awarded based on the hourly rates which were submitted as a part of this bid. I don't know how you could do it any other way. I'm not quite sure you can have this hypothetical contract. Um, so I'm suggesting that this be sent back to be um, re-evaluated based on hourly rates, which will give the taxpayers a much better advantage in letting these contracts, because I can assure you, although they weren't published to the public, I can assure you they're probably not going to be the lowest bidders, these people that you have allowed to be the number one, which is the transit group. Because the district never published the hourly rates, which were part of the bid, it's hard for you, as well as me, to even determine whether you're getting the best bang for the buck in this situation. So I'm asking you to go back, reevaluate the bid, look at the hourly rates so the taxpayers actually pay the lowest amount of money for these people to go out and take samples versus awarding it based on a hypothetical. So thank you. Thanks, John. I think I sent Mr. Ms. Mitnick a couple of texts as well, and I sent the handouts to Mr. Butler. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Capone. 
Moving to our virtual participants, we're going to start with Mark Perry. Mr. Perry, you recognized to speak? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yeah, just wanted to also on item 15, just the, I hope the importance can move forward of, of awarding contracts for water quality monitoring. Uh, particularly, it's so vital and important, and it's part of the major function of the district um, to do of the three partner organizations of FDEP and FDAX and and the district is the district's monitoring and efforts within within the whole watersheds of all the district areas. So water quality monitor, monitoring and reporting is so vital and particularly as it explains about existing permit and operational uh, monitoring for the Everglades restoration projects. As we bring these projects online, we want to make sure that we are monitoring their their inflows and outflows so we can really determine that they are functioning, they're working the way they were designed, and they're doing the job that we we want all want to do, and that is to restore, um, do Everglades restoration. And, and it also relates to, uh, go back to last year in May uh, of your governing board meeting on May 22nd last year when uh, Jennifer Reynolds uh, uh, presented the Northern Everglades and Estuaries Protection Program. And in that report, she identified all the monitoring that was done in the five-year averaging um, in all of the basins uh, north and east and west of the lake, uh, particularly the, the nine basins north of the lake with, uh, with all those nine water in the watershed north of the lake and also the uh, east side on the estuaries in both St. Lucie Estuary and the west coast on the Caloosahatchee. And those averages are very important. They show within the basins coming from each basin how much loading. And in the Lake Okeechobee watershed basin, she identified that the averaging about 529 metric tons a year of phosphorus at a concentration about 214 parts per billion average. And that's five times higher than the TMDL that was set back in 2001 for the lake. So the same uh, high levels, of course, in both St. Lucie Estuary uh, Watershed and the Caloosahatchee uh, showing multiple times higher than in these basins. But it's what's important is identifying within these basins, you can break it down into sub basins and really your monitoring, your water quality monitoring is so critical to look at over time to see how are we doing? How are the BMAPs doing? How are the BMPs doing within these watersheds in order to meet our goals of the total maximum daily load? So I encourage you to, you know, however you need to, is to award these contracts, get that water quality monitoring, and oversee that as a part of your critical, important part of the district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Mr. Chairman, I have no additional raised hands for this item. Thanks. Uh, is there any uh, board comment on consent agenda? Um, hearing none, could I have a motion to second and approve consent agendas um, excluding 17 and 18? I'll make the motion. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Hearing none, we'll call that question. Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Mr. Olipich? Yes. I'm going to vote yes. Vice Chair? Yes. Mr. Martinez? Yes. Mr. Butler? Yes. Uh, Mr. Steinle? Yes. Ms. Meads? Yes. And Colonel Roman? Yes. Thanks. That passes unanimously. We can move on now to discussion. Yeah. With Flood Awareness Month. Jesus, how are you? Good morning, everyone. My, my name is Jesus Carrasco. I'm the Bureau Chief for Region 2. And as part of the Field Operations Flood Awareness Month, I'll be sharing some of the highlights of what staff does year-round as part of our flood protection program. I'll also be sharing some before and after uh, work that the staff did um, during Hurricane Ian, as well as some lessons learned. Flood, co flood control is still crucial. Without the flood control system currently in place, if the 1947 hurricane happened today, millions of residents in major cities throughout the 16 district counties will be flooded. Prior to, the, prior to Hurricane Ian, the district continuously monitored weather conditions and water levels. 
Gates were opened, pump stations increased their operations, and primary canal level, water levels were lowered in anticipation of the storm. And here's a picture of some of the portable pumps that were deployed. All necessary preparations were made, such as securing uh, fuel station buildings, pump stations, and headquarters, topping off fuel supplies, placement of critical equipment, including helicopters and secure facilities. As you can see here, one of our helicopters being stored in one of our pump stations, uh, three, uh, S319. Staff was given time to prepare their homes and families prior to Hurricane Ian, which included working extended shifts. Emergency Operations Center was activated and staff as, as sta as, and staffed as part of the storm preparation. Strategic placement of temporary pumps and heavy equipment were staged throughout the South Florida Water Management District for quick deployment prior to Ian's arrival. All pumps and equipment were fueled and tested prior to the storm. As you can see here, one of the pictures here on the right is one of our uh, pumps um, being ready for deployment. Once the all clear was received, our rapid inspection assessment team, our REAT team, was deployed to the impacted areas. Debris teams removed vegetation, trees, and debris that could cause increased risk of flooding due to blockage of canals and structures. Staff worked day and night to reduce flood damage to communities. 24-7 pump operations continued until water receded. And the picture here in the center is 30 portable pumps that were staged throughout the upper chain of lakes. And the picture on the right is our staff installing one of the portable pumps, portable pumps in the upper chain of lakes after Hurricane Ian. Flight reconnaissance after the storm event allowed the district to quickly assess damages and make critical decisions on, on the distribution of resources. And here's one of our helicopters in flight and in, in route to the upper chain of lakes. So some of the lessons learned that we found from a field ops uh, perspective is that more of these portable pumps are needed. So, so, so far, four of these pumps have already been uh, on order. Um, additionally, um, more accessories for these pumps, such as pu uh, hoses, flanges, elbows, this type of accessories we, always, we found that we'd need as well. And then we also found that um, access to some of these structures uh, was difficult, specifically at S57, S58, we found that that was difficult. So since then, the field station has already started uh, repairing some of these access points. Uh, and some of the bigger areas, uh, that's being uh, worked through the capital program. So as the wet season starts, just recently, with the start of the wet season, we, we received a call to set up a portable pump uh, to be deployed to mitigate flooding uh, to the Miccosukee tribe. And uh, within a six hour period from the time that we received the call to the time that the pump was up and running, uh, it was all done within a six hour period. As you can see here in this picture, our staff doing the assessment. And then on the picture on the right is the pump already on site and operating uh, to mitigate the, the, the water conditions there. Field operations is divided into three regions. Region one is the St. Cloud and the Okeechobee field station along with the right-of-way section, and that's managed by Juan Bethencourt. Region two is the Fort Lauderdale, Big Cypress Basin, the Miami and Homestead field stations, that's managed by me. And region three, it consists of the West Palm field station, Cluiston field station, fleet and flight operations, and that's managed by Tom DeBole. As part of our core flood control, we operate and maintain a multi-purpose system, approximately 4,310 miles of canals and levees, 918 plus water control structures, 621 plus project culverts, and 90 pump stations. To flood our uh, flood control scope, our region network moves more than 20 million acre feet during an average year. And here in the picture on the right is our biggest structure, S65E, on the Kissimmee River. It has a design capacity of 24,000 CFS, that's cubic feet per second. Under the capital refurbishment program, the major engine and pump overhaul program conducts key life cycle interval services on major facility components. And here's Chris uh, Lukacs performing a 10,000 hour cylinder head replacement on an engine. Pump stations are required to have redundant emergency generators to ensure power is always available should there be an outage. And here, Christopher Grayson and Robert Congleton from the West Palm Beach Trade Support is performing maintenance on one of our generators. 
Scheduled preventive maintenance is performed to make sure the flood control system is ready for rainy season. And here are instrumentation control technicians Robert Van Valkenburg and Scott Tack from the Cluiston Field Station are rewiring an air compressor. Our trade support and pump stations sections work together to change out a recently overhauled engine. And here's a picture of the engine uh, swap out utilizing the roof hatch. And the picture on the right is Christopher Gonzalez from Homestead and Ricky Lasher from Fort Lauderdale uh, making repairs on one of our engines. Our trade support section from the, from the Miami Field Station removes and prepares pump for shipment. And that's a picture of them doing the job here on the right. And a district uh, class, C, class A CDL driver will deliver the pump to a repair facility in Tampa. And here on the far left is a picture of the uh, damaged impeller. And then uh, here in the center is what the impeller looked like after its repair. As part of our flood protection and canal levy section, uh, our Okeechobee Field Station's canal levy section completes the C40 canal stabilization project post dredging of the C40 canal. Additionally, the Okeechobee Field Station crews are removing more than 50 years of accu accumulated settlement out of the C25, C24, and C23 canals in the St. Lucie and Martin counties to improve flow. And here in this picture, you see the field station building a containment area to store the dredge material from the C23 canal. Land management sections maintain thousands of acres of district-owned land for water storage, conservation, restoration, and public use. And here's James Elmore. I think you saw his name earlier. Uh, <laughs> cleaning out a drainage ditch on the Harmony Ranch to ensure flood protection to the surrounding communities. Each field station, with the support of the vegetation management staff, removed hazardous trees from the canal right away as part of the tree management program. And here on the right is uh, Ryan Brown celebrating uh, the fallen of a big, dangerous Australian pine tree. Our right-of-way section performs inspections to ensure permit compliance and to minimize unwanted encroachments, which could be a potential impediment of flow. And here's Nick Geip, uh checking a low member clearance on the C-33 canal, and Stephen Diaz and Manny Rodriguez inspecting the Biscayne Trail. Part of our fleet management, our district fleet inventory totals 1,098 vehicles and equipment. On, on, on road vehicles, our light duty is 900, 900, 496, medium duty 73, heavy duty 66, and construction equipment such as dozers, loaders, excavators, a total of 97. Other, other equipment such as a marine equipment of airboats and towboats, totals 102. 33 ATVs, 200 trailers, and 26 tractors. And here you can see on a picture on the right, our, our uh, drag line that's used to remove sediment out of our canals. Our district technicians maintain and repair the district's fleet at each of the eight field stations located throughout the 16 county area of responsibility. And here is Adrian Alvargueta performing preventive maintenance on one of our vehicles. Part of our restoration project support, a failed gated culvert on the LA Canal was found after Hurricane Ian and required installation of a temporary earthen cofferdam. And here on the picture you see the aerial view, and on the right is the closer view or ground level view of the failed gated culvert. And then this slide is the work that was being done to make the repairs and as well as what the site looked like after repairs were completed. On the storm treatment area two, cell three plug installation, the installation of 50 earthen plugs along the east side of cell three within storm treatment areas make our STAs more resilient for flood control. And here a picture on the right is the first 12 plugs out of the 50 being worked on. And this is a closer view of the, of the work that was being done on those plugs with uh, site number 10 and site number 12. Big Cypress Basin in Collier County maintains 134 miles of canals. Staff maintains 34 structures for flood protection and approximately 825,000 acre feet of stormwater moved through the BCB structures annually. This is one of the canals in Big Cypress Basin. This is the Miller Canal. The canals are, have a tendency of being somewhat shallow and at certain times of the year, you have high vegetation growth. And here in the picture in the center is staff performing the maintenance, removing that vegetation, 
using our convoy boat and our trash truck. And this is what the area looks like after the job is done. In this slide, Mako Touche, one of the BCB employees there, he's repairing the washout of the Bird Rookery Weir on the Coquihatchee Canal. And here's Mako doing repairs using their great all. Pump station staff replaced refurbished components at the Peking Union Restoration Pump Station. And here on the left is the refurbished pump impeller and the diffuser. And down on the bottom there, you can see Eric Weston operating the crane doing the pump removal. So at the end of the day, it's our people that make the difference, day in and day out, night in and night out. And uh, I just want to highlight some of the other folks uh, that get the job done behind the scenes. And here's uh, Brian Ferlin uh, for Homestead Field Station and Ozell Jones. Charles Lovett and Henry Picado, also from the Homestead Field Station Fleet Technicians. Daniel Bidwell, Rohan Muir, and Juan Gato, along with Alex Lemus and Carlos Quijano from the Miami Field Station. In this slide here, we have uh, Elne Victor and Carl Dean removing debris in the Arch Creek, and Lenora Chile, our admin assistant in Miami. Mike Perry and Eric Weston, also from the BCB a pump station program, performing maintenance. Adam Kennard and Josh Charles from the BCB field station also preventing, uh, performing some preventive maintenance. Jorge Caridad, our senior fleet technician, here is installing a safety equipment for Fort Lauderdale and Francisco Naranjo, uh, diesel engine specialist, performing an engine overhaul for one of our engines at 332 Bravo. In this slide, Christopher, Ro Christopher Roman and Stephen Combs removing uh, debris out of the C-10 spur for Fort Lauderdale. Allison Dioviera, a planner scheduler for West Palm, and Corey Hall. Richard Smith and Trey Nichols from West Palm Beach Field Station. Orelvis Ruiz and Thomas Geary uh, performing maintenance on an air compressor for Cluiston. Gregory Mathis and Craig Means, along with Daniel Whitehead, also from the Cluiston Field Station. William Weaver and Robert Hancock from the Okeechobee Field Station. And Wayne Place and Donna Robertson from the Okeechobee Field Station as well. For St. Cloud is William Moore and Keith Brown, our contract inspection specialist. And here, uh, Keith is performing a survey on Lake Marion. And also for St. Cloud is Danny Garcia and James Dunn performing maintenance. And here's our four flight operations, James Davis and J.K. Wells, our senior pilot. And with that, I'll take any questions you may have. Uh, thanks very much. It's an excellent presentation and wonderful staff that we have. Thank, Thank you, you for sir. highlighting them. Does anyone have any questions or comments? All right. Other than thanks, thanks. Thank you. For the record, Mr. Chairman, we have no public comment on this item. I'm sorry. I <laughs> forgot about the public comment on that one. Thanks. Mr. Butler. Just without letting that one go, um, just wow. Thank you to our staff. I'm glad we were able to, glad Jesus was able to go through and recognize some of our staff there, and we got so many more. And the function and, and, and what they do, we all know it. But it, it is just so important to, to, to many people's lives. You know, when I think about the pump stations there in the Okeechobee area and the flood protection that is provided to all those homes, those pump stations go down. There's some homes that are underwater. And um, it is a, it's the absolute critical function. And, um, you know, I, I, I appreciate the staff and all the work that's done in preventative maintenance. And, um, I just I, I thank you to, to to our entire crew for the work they do. Thanks, Mr. Butler. We we've come a long way since 1947, <laughs> and, and I I was in that storm. I was <clears throat> very young then, but my grandfather were picking people off the rooftops, bringing them to high ground. In 1947, it was uh, probably. Four to six foot of water across Davie, western part of Fort Lauderdale. So, come a long way, and I have to 
say the same thing Ben said without repeating it. We got the greatest staff to take care of and keep people safe. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Bertrand. We'll go to um, item 21 and uh, Dr. Moran. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, um, Governing Board members. Um, I'm going to tie in um, to Jesus' presentation and talk a little bit about flood planning as well, why our transition to the, the item 21 on the agenda. Um, so um, as part of this um, Flood Awareness Month, I think it's important that we remember um, how this uh, monumental system was created initiated um, uh, through the construction of uh, canals that really allow for agricultural to agricultural operations in the area and then later um, led to extensive ur urban development that we have uh, in, in South Florida. Um, after major hurricanes, and, and Mr. Berger just mentioned the 1947 uh, one, uh, we were authorized in 1948 by the Corps to build this massive stormwater system um, and, and this is really lays the foundation for the creation of South Florida Water Management District. So it's our uh, primary, uh, I would say, first uh, role function as an agency. Um, here in the second slide, we have a conceptual map of the major features that uh, belong to the CNSF project, uh, which includes uh, dikes um, and levees like uh, Hoover Dyke, uh, uh, it's a 143-mile dike around Lake Okeechobee. We have um, the EAA protective levee around the Everglades Agricultural Area, also the levee there um, between the water conservation area and the urban areas, um, uh, all the fully developed areas in the East Coast. Uh, we have uh, extensive drainage systems as well, uh, throughout the coast, and we have our coastal structures, salinity control structures also at the end of those major canals um, there. Uh, the major construction of those project features um, occur between the 50s and the 70s, so the major, major components were built uh, during this time, uh, and we have been uh, performing very successful operations and maintenance. Jesus show a lot in his presentation here, really to allow the system to continue to function, and really, one important point here is really passing beyond the, the design line, the design life of the system. We are talking about a seven years old system, and being able to successfully maintain and operate the system today is really a merit of the, the team for South Florida Water Management District that does intensive work, incredible work. Um, along with this O&M and operational maintenance, we also had uh, in, 2000s, uh, in the 2000 um, authorization for the comprehensive Everglades uh, plan that was addressing some of the unintended consequences of the system in the environment and really uh, restoring, uh, allowing us to restore and make important pro progresses that we are making in, in, in restor restoring our precious ecosystem there. Uh, this game, this is, is a, a many players game. Uh, the video uh, of the introduction today really shows that. All the different responsible parties there that include the Army Corps and South Florida Water Management District. Uh, those are the operators of the main system, uh, really draining those larger volumes um, of water away from communities and business on a 24 seven hour, uh, 24 day seven, uh, 24 hour seven days all the time and really, um, facilitating also the recharge of groundwater to our aquifers that really sustain our water sources um, in, in South Florida. It's very important to, man, to make this connection as well. And as we recognize this agency efforts in really successfully operating and maintaining the system, uh, the CNSF system, is, is even more impressive to think about how the system evolved during those years. So we have here uh, um, images recognizing how um, land development, extensive land development that occur, really um, uh, areas that were designed as agricultural areas. This is very important when we're thinking about designing a, a flood control system. So extensive areas that were assumed to be agricultural that are today fully built, 
um, yeah, so really um, a highly urbanized area throughout the significant portion of the CNSF system, and um, a large population increase. We are now at a 9.3, uh, around 9.3 uh, million people in 2023, and really expecting this to increase to more than 11 million in 2045. We also have um, evolving uh, climate conditions, so climate some of the climate patterns that we are observing there too, uh, modifying and really uh, impacting the performance of the system. So um, here are just some example of evolving conditions in rainfall. Um, so some observed rainfall that we are seeing changes there, um, changing patterns. Uh, here we also see uh, tailwater elevation. So uh, again, observing the trend there, the upward trend and the water elevations, which is really reduces our uh, discharge capacity, impacts the discharge capacity of the system, the gravity system that we have. And we also have a, a graph here just showing evolving conditions throughout those years. All those graphs we're talking about long-term evolving conditions that we need to consider as part of planning for the system, planning and operating. So um, this groundwater levels and salinity, so really showing trends there in areas where we see uh, upward trend in, in average groundwater levels and salinity concentration. And when we talk about um, flooding, we also need to recognize all the, the sources of flooding that we have. Uh, in Florida, we also have a very particular condition here. Drivers come from everywhere, north, south, uh, east, west, up and down. We have uh, storm surge um, and sea level rise. As flooding drivers coming from the oceans, we have uh, groundwater levels that really re reduce soil storage coming from the bottom. We have rainfall, so extreme rainfall events. It's very important for us to characterize those, to understand when they occur, especially when they occur jointly at the same time, so we can really continue to assess the performance of the system and understand what else is, is needed, how we can enhance the system. And um, this is actually what our flood protection level of service has been doing for almost a decade now. A decade now. Um, so they really assess the system as a whole under current conditions, looking at those evolving conditions and also projecting future conditions. They establish performance metrics to really help to assess those assets, what's the performance, and really uh, are moving towards um, proposing adaptation mitigation strategies, so projects, how we can enhance, maintain, and uh, enhance and improve those assets that we have in the system today. Uh, this program has been assessing all those basins. We have here on the right a map showing uh, conditions of today, uh, showing uh, what kind of rain event we are able to successfully um, uh, protect uh, today and, and really um, observing into the future how those conditions are reduced based on, on not accounting for the, the adaptation projects that we'll be bringing, but if we really, it really emphasize the need for us to enhance and improve the system so we can not allow this to happen into this future scenario to really happen. It's important also to recognize that the level of service program has been leading our way as we start the CNSF study uh, with the Army Corps now, really, again, looking at all of those pieces together with the Army Corps validating our findings. And uh, we have, um, since um, the district resiliency program was established at the district, and also uh, Resilient Florida program was established at the state and FDEP, we have been um, now putting together a, a resiliency plan. This is our draft 2023 plan. Um, the plan is now is currently open for public comments until June 2023, June 23rd. And um, what we do here is really we, we look at all the, the recommendations coming from the level of service in other areas in the agency, and we compile a list of priority projects, what are really the investment needs that we have in this agency, and really establish a path on how we can start looking at those um, investment needs that are needed to maintain the the system functioning today and under future conditions. Uh, we also look at sources of funding for all those projects. Uh, here is just a, an image on how we partner with local, with state and federal agencies from the very beginning, validating the studies, the assessments, bringing all of that to a planning, uh, to planning efforts, planning documents, so we have common agendas, we understand what's priority, 
and then uh, looking at funding opportunities so we can move to implementation and project construction. Uh, earlier this year, uh, Governor DeSantis uh, signed Executive Order 2306. We celebrated today in, um, in um, Drew opening, Openings Remarks. Uh, so really uh, an important achievement for us and uh, allocating important resources uh, for Everglades restoration, continuation of Everglades restoration and expediting SERP, and also continue to strengthen those resiliency efforts through the Resilient Florida program. And um, we are here today to really uh, I talk to you about um, uh, what we are doing now, what we are getting from Resilient Florida program. This is our very first um, uh, grant award that we are receiving from this program. We had um, Eddie Boza, the program director, presenting uh, Resilient Florida program to us uh, on May 24, just uh, two weeks ago, um, talking about the importance of this program, achievements already made throughout the state, like statewide investments in resilience. Uh, through the Resilient Florida Grant, talking about the plan they are also putting together, a statewide flooding and sea level rise plan, uh, comprehensive database, a, a statewide data set and assessment. Um, we have also, uh, this program also established the Florida, Florida, Florida Flood Hub for Applied Science, uh, which is looking at all the data needed, looking at projections, sea level rise, rainfall, we are partnering with them in a lot of those initiatives and um, also part, uh, finding funds for regional resiliency entities there. This program was established by Senate Bill 1954 in 2021, so we are in the third cycle of this uh, grant program now. The central, the core of this program is really now addressing sea level rise and flood uh, resiliency, so very important to also emphasize this in this uh, Flood Awareness Month. So in 2022, we submitted eight um, applications to Resilient Florida program. We were awarded four, and that's why we are here today to talk to you about those four. Um, it's very important to also pay attention on this deadline that we have to complete the projects. It seems long, but it's not. We have several steps. Those are all construction projects, so we have to be really aligning all the teams here, and the engineering teams, all the construction team to work together with us so we can achieve this deadline of June 30, 2026 to fully implement, fully pay uh, those, those projects that we were awarded um, through the 2022 cycle. So first one is our uh, Corbett Wildlife uh, Management Area Hydrologic Restoration and Corbett Levee Resiliency Project. Uh, this project is uh, going to um, allow us to repair and update the Corby Levee. Uh, it also improves the stormwater um, infrastructure in the region as a whole that will allow uh, the Indian Trail Improvement District to have more operational flexibility of their system, the secondary system uh, that is adjacent to the, to the levee in this location. It also allows us to safely retain water for hydrologic restoration within this um, wildlife management area. We have a total of 60,000 acres of critical habitat area there, and restoration of this more natural hydro period that will be um, allowed through the restoration of the levee will really help us improve fish and wildlife habitat. Uh, in 2016, we received funding from the state to begin straining of the levee, and we uh, implemented phase one, which was 2.6 miles of the levee. And now we are jumping into phase two. Uh, this is for the straining of the remaining three mile portion of the levee. Uh, we have significant infrastructure and population that are uh, benefited by this project, 36,000 people. We have uh, significant critical assets also uh, that are within this, the project influencing area. Um, and in this case, we have uh, the Palm Beach County received the grant from FDEP, Resilient Florida Program, and we will be uh, signing an um, interagency agreement with Palm Beach County to execute this project. So uh, they received 7.7 .7 million. This is a 50% cost share agreement, and um, uh, we have today here just um, your, um, for your um, um, authorization for your evaluation, this uh, interagency agreement with Palm Beach County. I produce a map, a quick map, for all of those I know in our dis uh, discussions we were just uh, trying to better locate those projects. I believe you have those printed. So this only just highlight to you 
the location of the levy, the water management area, and really the population that lives uh, in this area that will be benefited by the, the project as well. One, bi one piece of the way we set up this project uh, at this time is that this is an important uh, piece there. For us to fully allow the hydro, the hydro pure uh, restoration in this location, uh, Palm Beach County helped us to identify this too, that the 0 0.6 mile north-south levee segment, it's a small segment of this levee, but we, it needs to be aligned. The construction timing for this project, which is a, a SERP project, this belongs to SERP Luxahatchee uh, River Watershed Restoration Project, the, the C18 West Impound, Impoundment West project. So for us to really get the full benefits of hyd restoring hydro periods there, we need to build this 0 0.6 mile at the same time we are restoring the, the levees. So we're gonna be aligning the, the two projects here uh, for the implementation. Moving to um, a second project that we were awarded. This is directly with South Florida Water Management District. Uh, this is our coastal structures hardening and self-preservation mode. Um, we have um, an urgent need to optimize and harden the operation of these structures during major storms. So it really allowing us to better operate the system during surge and higher tide events. Uh, we had um, to lock um, those coastal structures up during major hurricanes like Her Ian, Irma, Matthew, and Dorian, a large number of structures because we need to do that very early and we don't have full remote uh, capacity to operate those structures today. So that um, really exposed um, um, the, the well fields, we think, upstream of those coastal structures to saltwater intrusion and also exacerbate some of the, 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 up, the upstream flood risks. Uh, of course, this decision is made also considering that if we lock, if we lose communication and they're locked open, the risks are much higher than, than those risks that I'm pointing here. But the, the benefits of this project is that uh, will really allow us to better operate, to uh, may delay the decision on, on having to lock those gates um, open to a very close time when we have better forecast. Uh, so really it will um, allow us to protect more, um, more, of the, more areas of the population by really just locking gates open when the situation is confirmed, the path of the storm is confirmed, and we, we, we have more information to be able to, take, to make this decision. Uh, so what we do, we're gonna be focusing on enhancing electronic and mechanical components in these coastal structures, doing small fixes like extending the top of the gate and flood proofing, so again, just trying to extend as much as possible the time we can operate those. We are receiving 6.3 million uh, from FDP for this project, Resilient Florida program. Again, 50% uh, cost share uh, match with us. And again, I produce a map here showing the, the coastal structures that are now uh, under consideration for this project. So we are beginning design and like refining the design of all those coastal structures and what are the components that we need to bring to them. They differ a little bit between them. But it's important also to see on this map that the yellow shades are, again, uh, influencing areas that are, will be benefited by this project. We have uh, really more than two million people living in these areas, uh, more than a thousand critical assets, and, and really, uh, I, I think almost all of the well fields that will be uh, directly or indirectly benefiting from this project. The third one is um, hardening of S2, S3, S4, S7, S8 engine control panels. So those, those are the, the control panels for um, those pump stations that were built in the 50s and the 70s. In the, in the 70s. Um, we have a, a structure inspection program in this agency and um, this specific uh, project here was already characterized as a C4, which is one of the highest uh, vulnerability criteria that we get under this. So we are, again, we were talking about extending design life of components of our CNSF system, and this is a great example. So um, we are reaching here uh, a limitation on, on, on what we could do, so we are really gonna be replacing those panels. They are on, at the end of their use for life to reduce the flooding risks and increase water management flexibility. We're gonna be attaching a new emergency shutdown equipment uh, it's similar to the previous project in terms of um, enhancing remote capability, operation capability there. So the control room will be able to monitor each of those uh, engines uh, for the pump stations with this project. 
uh, also we can um, refer to that as um, a project that will um, reduce compound flooding risks across Palm Beach and in Broward County. We have here a map too that uh, we lay out the, the influencing areas that are like directly or indirectly impacted by this, the operation of those four structures, five structures there. Uh, we have construction initiated in this project already. Um, Resilient Florida is providing 8.5 million to us and we are um, again 50% cost share agreement. Final one, we have um, our L8, FAB and G539 uh, pump resilience upgrade. This is again one um, um, agreement uh, with Resilient Florida that we are receiving directly the money of uh, South Florida Water Management District and we'll be enhancing the reliability of G539 pump and the L8 uh, flood equalization basin. We're gonna replace, in this case, six electrical submersible pumps configuring two pump stages. This is the same case of the last one where they were uh, ranked as C4 in the structure inspection program, really extending the useful life of those, uh, those pumps up to now, so major need to, to replace those. Um, we have here also um, uh, an indirect uh, water supply uh, benefit associated with this project as we consider that we have um, LA's FEB basin receiving flows from C51 West and C8 drainage basins and really allowing us to store up to 45 acre feet of uh, storage capacity that reduce flows to the tide during storm events and also provide storage uh, that can be beneficial during the dry season. Uh, so we have, uh, again, the self-preservation mode is common to all those projects. Uh, we are gonna be able to operate this uh, and monitor each of the engines of this pump station from the control rule. There's this added capacity that we are bringing through this project. And in this one, we are receiving four million uh, from FDP to, to execute that. Uh, again, we have a map there of the uh, influencing area for this project. We have, um, uh, almost 400 people there. We have a significant number of well fields, uh, almost 200 critical assets also. With that, I would like to present to you um, a resolution uh, for you to um, authorize entering into three agreements with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and one interagency agreement with Palm Beach County for the planning, design, and construction of four projects awarded to the Resilient Florida Grant Program. So. Those projects are listed there along with the contract number. And with that, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Mays. Do we have uh, public comment on this? We do, Mr. Chairman. We're gonna start with the Board of Supervisors from the Indian Trail Improvement District, President Michael Johnson, followed by Mary McNichols and then Paul Linton. Good morning, board and uh, chairman. Um, I'd like to start by saying thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Johnson. I am the current board president for Indian Trail Improvement District, resident and farmer in the acreage. And uh, chairman, you hit the nail on the head when you said when you can see all these uh, groups come together, it's amazing what can get done. Um, I want to thank you guys, staff, um, Mr. Bartlett. We had a board meeting last night. Mr. Linton attended that, constantly keeping us updated um, just on half of the residents, we know we say thank you for this. It's a huge safety concern for us. Um, <clears throat> now that uh, Florida, sorry, FWC is able to, you know, really manage Corbett the way they want to, it provides a safety for us. As you know, this runs along the MO, M0 canal, which provides, uh, you know, fire safety for us, uh, hydration, all these other things. And this just is something that, we, you know, we're really glad to see moving forward. And we just want to say thank you very much. Thank you. Mary McNichols is our next public commenter, followed by Paul Linton. Morning, Mr. Chair, Board, Executive Director Bartlett, and Dr. Moran. I'm Mary McNicholas with Jeffrey B. Sluggan Associates, representing Indian Trail Improvement District. I can honestly tell you, to follow Michael was just spot on. We specifically found out February 6th, the afternoon February 6th, that we did get this. This is a multi-jurisdictional, multi-agency group. We cannot thank your staff enough. 
Drew Bartlett, when you tell us you're going to follow up on something and you're going to do the project like we know we've needed for 12 years before that, we can't thank you enough for being a man of your word. Jay Steinle, thank you for following up for all of this. Carolyn Moran, Dave Colangelo, on Palm Beach County side, I have to thank uh, former County Commissioner Melissa McKinley, who actually pushed the Water Resource Task Force to put in an additional 12 million, or two million, excuse me, two million dollars. That's wishful thinking, that's future, future planning. Um, but Todd Von Laren has been incredible. Paul Linton is on the team in this past year and a half, and he's been extraordinary. Um, we cannot thank FWC, Tom Reinhardt, enough. Uh, enough thanks. We just appreciate being taken seriously and appreciate the prevention for the Northwest community of Palm Beach County. So thank you again. Thank you, Ms. McNichols. Uh, good morning, Paul Linton with uh, Palm Beach County, Water Resource Manager. I uh, just want to thank you guys. You know, we came, Palm Beach County came with $2 million. You guys are providing all the engineering. We're looking forward to getting this project done. I know it's not a big project for the South Florida Water District as a whole, but it is a very important project. The Corbett area drains to the southeast, so all that water runs down and it's held back by that levee, and that levee is protecting about 40,000 residents in Palm Beach County, and that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Linton. Moving to our virtual participants, and I have no raised hands, Mr. Chairman. I make a motion. Or do we board? Uh, any discussion by the board? I, Ms. I just would like to say this is a great improvement, and I can remember many years ago this uh, residential area was flooded dramatically. So it's a great safety to the general public and and a benefit to the Corbett area to re rehydrate uh, the Corbett area. And I, I have one question. I, I'm sure that we have infalls and outfalls in this design for the Corbett area. So when water reaches a certain level. Yes, there is, there is, um, we have culverts there um, that we can, um, that we would, help us address the, the um, maintain and operate the levy there and we have also um, a gate that will allow us to um, discharge as needed and maintain the levels. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lepich. Thank you very much. Always a great presentation. Can you please go to page three? Sorry, page three. Thank you. It's the one with all the, yes, thank you. So I just have a, a couple of questions that kind of lead up to um, the uh, S2, S3, S4 um, control panels and also S7 and S8. And I kind of alluded to this during the briefing, but I think it's important and to me and just to kind of look through this. So. On, the, on this visual, uh, we, you have that the, the, major comp the major project features construction 1950s to 1970s, and you have all of these different things. And I, I, so I noticed that the EAA, the Everglades Agricultural Area, is one of those things, you know, just like the uh, protective levee from the Lower East Coast or um, Lake Okeechobee. Could, could you talk about that a bit? I mean, how does that qualify as a major feature of the Central and South Florida project? So the overall goal for the project is to manage water in the region. So all the, the, the components that are needed for us to maintain levels or pervade water in the, in, the, in the region and for the different functions that we have there are part of the CNSF. They were designed along with the CNSF system. So we, we have not only the canals to provide drainage, but we also have the levee and additional features that would help us hold water 
where we need at certain levels, like the water conservation areas there, and also EAA. So we have, so all those features belong to the overall like design of the project. I hope I'm understanding your so question. So when they right. when they built that um, in bet between 1950 and 1970, they they built the big levee around it. Is it called a levee or a dike? The dike I, underneath oh, the yeah. EAA, yeah. and then so does the yellow. Um, refer to all of the little canals inside? Yeah, all the, the features that we have to drain there. What are well. the features in there? The canals. Are mostly. they like big canals? Or they, I've never been in there. Are they like little canals? Do they look mostly like? Mostly ditches that are ditches separated by the agricultural, yeah, yes. Okay. So if I can, yeah. Mr. Olympus. Sure, thank you. Um, when you're looking at this map, that area designated in yellow, the Everglades Agricultural Area, that is as you know it. That is the area that you've driven through going across the state. Mr. Goss just drove through it probably this morning on his way here to this meeting. Um, the infrastructure that's contained within there, the water management district infrastructure is part of the Central and Southern Florida Flood Control Project or the Miami Canal, North New River Canal, Hillsboro Canal, the, as well as the West Palm Beach Canal. You can see all those canals coming out of Lake Okeechobee and the blue lines on this graphic going down through the Lower East Coast all the way down to Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and here in West Palm Beach. Um, the pumping stations, S2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, are the pump stations that ring essentially to the north and south, the Everglades Agricultural Area, and provide drainage and flood control for that area. It's surrounded by that red line there on this graphic, which is a levee. Uh, it's got various designations of what that levee is, but that is the CNSF system. So as part of this agenda item, um, those pump stations, two, three, four, seven, and eight, um, are getting infrastructure improvements funded through this grant opportunity. So it's critical infrastructure to the water management district that we've been able to identify external funding for to improve um, the risk that associated to the residents of South Florida. Okay, thank you. So the, um, I mean, certainly I've been in the EAA, but I don't know that I've ever seen the little ditches, you know, I have never seen all of the inner workings. And so I was just curious. So all of those inner workings are also part of the South Florida water. They don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, Correct. like, um, the, like the Lake Worth drainage district, you know what I mean? That, right. that is not ours. That's a secondary system or whatever. Are all of the systems inside that yellow section um, South Florida Water Management District systems. No, all of the um, canals that are on private property that served private entities, those are not South Florida Water Management District. The only ones that are ours are those ones that are in blue, and plus a couple other ones that you can probably barely see on this particular map. Okay, the, the big ones. And mm -hmm. so then going back, I'm sorry, it's like the second page to the last or something. It was the page that showed those pump... Uh, I think that was it. <coughs> one before. One, the one that showed. Keep. I'm sorry. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. No, that one. That one. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So you have S2. They're like backwards. S2. S3. S4 is up by Clewiston. S8, S7, or S7, S8. So those, those, John or um, Carolina, would you please just, who do those pump stations, I see you have this, this broad um, color everywhere, but how, how do those, are they just basically um, benefiting the EAA or are they benefiting everybody? Yeah, so we made this map there. This is what we call influencing areas. So it w through the operation of those five structures, we can directly or indirectly maintain levels in all the parts that, in the main canals, of course, but affecting all the area that is highlighted in, in yellow there. So there is significant benefits for the populations also living downstream of those through the operation of those structures. Okay, and how did these structures affect the stormwater treatment areas, or don't they? 
just by regulating the levels and allowing us to move water as needed and um, in the, as in the speed that is needed. And so it will help the with the storm with the um, with the STAs. It will help. It will help in, in general to maintain the water levels and move water as needed. Those are pumps that were really uh, getting old, passing their design life. So really, by giving this in engine control. Uh, panels, uh, the upgrading the panels will have better capacity to communicate with headquarters. We're going to be able to operate them remotely more efficiently. Really updating infrastructure that is that is aging infrastructure. So that's that's what we're going to be doing here. Okay, I appreciate it, and I know I'm pushing people who want to uh, probably move on, but I, I I had asked about this during the briefing. Yes. I think these are very important areas. Uh, there's always this rub. Um, regarding the Everglades agricultural area and all the benefits that they get from the South Florida Water Management District being totally tied into our permitting system. It's like we're one in the same. And then just how we kind of, we, we have a tendency to really uh, f focus on this system. And as we're doing all of this um, resiliency work, you know, if there's a way to make sure that we're benefiting everybody, yeah. Is there a way to benefit the St. Lucie and the Caloosahatchee? Is there a way to benefit the, the Loxahatchee? I don't know. You know, in 1951, there's, uh, they were dead serious about having a third outlet south of um, the EAA because at the time it made sense. It never happened because it w the, the land was too valuable just like now. But I think sometimes when we discuss these things, you know, we're just running through it. It's billions of dollars, we're just running through it. You know, I wanna know how it benefits all of us, all of the time, not just the places with uh, the colored on the map. But um, you're doing a great job, and um, thank you. So if I can, just to add to that, so how it benefits all of us. Um, yes, these particular stations, S234, 7, and 8, were originally constructed for the flood control that was back in the 50s and 60s. Um, fast forward to today and how it benefits all of us, in particular S7 and S8, that's critical infrastructure to move water south. And that's great, and that's what I want to hear, Mr. Mitnick. I want to, I want to learn about those things, because for me, when I see something like this, that separates it, you know what I mean, by color and section. Um, I don't think that's all, all, there's always the opportunity for everything to, of course it's all interconnected. So um, thank you for, for, mm -hmm. for sending water south and let's send, like Mr. Bergeron says, long live the Everglades. Let's send more water south. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Ellis. Mr. Butler. Just one comment real quick, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate staff working with DEP. I appreciate DEP and the legislature for providing these grant opportunities. And, uh, you know, Dr. Moran, everything you're doing here is so important. And it, um, you know, it's important for us to, uh, to recognize that, uh, that this funding is, you know, not a, you know, it, we're, we're lucky to get this funding. So I'm appreciative of it. Thanks, Mr. Brother. I'm going to make a motion um, regarding resolution number 2023-0607 to authorize entering into the three grant agreements, the Florida DEP and one interagency agreement with Palm Beach County for the planning, designing, and constructing of four projects awarded through the Resilient Florida Grant Program um, listed in the agenda, Coastal Structures Enhancement and Self-Preservation Mode Project Contract Number 46 zero 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 four seven eight eight the hardening of s2 s3 s4 s7 and s8 engine control panels um, regarding the south of lake okeechobee project the l8 febg 539 pump resiliency upgrades and the jw corbett wildlife management area hydraulic restoration and corporate levy resiliency contract i'll second the attorney's reading on that <laughs> I have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, I'm going to call that question. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Mr. Olipich. Yes. I'm going to vote yes. Uh, Vice Chair Wagner. Yes. Just in time, Mr. Martinez. Yes. Mr. Butler. Yes. Uh, Ms. Meads. Yes. Colonel Roman. Yes. Thank you. That passes unanimously. <clears throat> 
Dr. Moran, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move now to uh, technical reports with water conditions. Mr. Mitnick. All right. Thank you, Rosie. Morning, board members. Uh, as usual, quickly run through um, the water conditions report. So just looking back at the rainfall, you can see the last two months, April and May, we've actually had um, above average rains following that four months of below average rain. So overall, um, for the month of May, we finished just slightly above average um, for that particular month. But as we talked about, I think um, towards the end of uh, last month, the wasn't quite before the board meeting, but just after the board meeting, um, district meteorologists sort of called the end of the dry season, um, and they declared that March 14th was the day that the wet season started. So just to close out um, the dry season, now this graphic is going to start showing some of the wet season rains um, as we move forward in time here. So, so far, although we're just barely into the wet season, just a couple weeks here from the 14th of May to June 6th yesterday, um, we're, we're tracking well above average. Um, we've gotten some pretty decent rains over the last um, week or so. And um, although the next, I'll get to this at the end of the presentation, the, the next couple days to seven to 10 days will probably be a little bit below average, but overall June is projected to be above average. Um, but how that has affected the lake systems, you know, this is the time of year where all the lake systems um, north of Lake Okeechobee sort of get down to their summer pools, the lowest point in their regulation schedules. So all of them, you can see East Toho and West Toho were all brought down to their summer pools down here and they'll start beginning to rise as we move forward in times that those rains continue and basin runoff comes into the lake systems itself. For Lake Kissimmee, however, um, it was sort of a balancing act that we went through. Um, got some pretty decent rains right there in the April time frame that bumped the lake up and deferred it from that sort of trajectory going down. Um, once we reinitiated, just continuing to deliver, wa deliver water down the Kissimmee River, that also brought down the lake system. But then these more recent rains up here towards the end of May bump the lake back up. So it sort of cut the corner going across that regulation schedule. The Corps of Engineers has had a deviation in place, I believe, for some of the construction that had gone on along the Kissimmee River. So that's what we were able to utilize in, in cutting across that corner. But um, as we get on the other side, um, you'll see a similar type operation for Kissimmee River. Um, we're continuing to deliver that 300 CFS down the river that Lawrence always talks about in his presentation. Um, and Kissimmee will start to generally rise as these other lakes begin to fill and start moving water from the upper chain down into Lake Kissimmee. Similar sort of story for Lake Estepoga. It was brought down in accordance with its regulation schedule. Now it's at its summer pool, so it'll just kind of track right along here um, throughout the next several weeks and months as we go through the wet season. A little bit farther south for Lake Okeechobee, as of this morning, Lake Okeechobee was right there at 14 feet. Um, so you're sitting probably right about here today, um, a little bit higher than what it was when this projection was originally run um, last week. But as you can see, this is sort of the anticipated lake levels under Lohr's 2008 type operations that you can reasonably expect as we go through um, the rest of the wet season. So as some folks have already commented on, Mr. Butler, it's a little bit higher than it typically is. So I went back and I looked back through at least 2010. Um, the lake is just a little bit lower than we were in 2010, 2016, and 2018 for this time of year. So there were those three other years that it was higher than where it currently is for right now. Um, that's sort of where it stands right now. We'll continue to monitor its progress and lake stages and um, deliver beneficial flows um, to all the downstream areas that need it. So how that compares to the ecological envelope, you can tell you're well above what the ecological envelope is for this time of year. Um, you're foreseeably, unless Mother Nature takes a serious dry spell, um, not likely to get back into the ecological envelope for quite some time, probably once we get over here into the September, August timeframe. 
is most likely when it'd be able to return back into the ecological envelope. So not much really to say on this graphic in the next one because it's just the very beginning of the wet season, so there's not a whole lot of flows um, coming through the system. You can see some of it starting to pick up. You're getting some of these flows into Lake Okeechobee to the tune of about 54,000 acre feet. Um, 150,000 acre feet have gone to the Clusahatchee estuary with about a um, little more than half originating back in Lake Okeechobee from those beneficial flows that I had mentioned. And then over on the St. Lucie side, just some basin runoff from the C44 basin and then the other basins, 23, 24, and 25 are just starting to pick up as some of those rains come into the region. For the southern portion of the system, very similar story. Um, still some flows um, into the conservation areas because we were moving water south prior to it just starting to rain um, just last week. Um, so we're, like I said, we'll have a couple days here where it's a little bit drier weather, so I would anticipate resuming um, those flows south from the lake um, this weekend and start moving some of that water out of the lake down into the conservation areas. Down in the Everglades National Park, um, we've continued to move water out of Conservation Area 3 in accordance with the Tamiami Trail flow formula. So those flows have never stopped. Um, they had reduced, but once again, with water levels increasing in Water Conservation Area 3A, um, then those flows and that formula are also increasing. For Area 1, the Corps of Engineers is moving about 1,500 cubic feet per second from Area 1 down into Area 2. And you'll see that um, on this graphic up here because Area 1 is above schedule. So they've opened up the S10s and they're moving that water from Area 1 down into Area 2. Likewise, Area 2 is also above its schedule. So they have opened up the S11s and they're moving just shy of 2,000 cubic feet per second from Area 2 down in Area 3. And then because of those operations, you can sort of see the response um, down in area three of water levels increasing as well as from that direct rainfall up here that has occurred um, most recently. As I already mentioned, continuing to move water out of area three down into the park, um, that's happening through S12 CD and the 333 structures. The L29 canal is just below the 8.3, I think it was at 8.1 this morning when I looked at it. Um, so we're continuing to move water through there. We're continuing to operate the 356 pump station and pull some of that seepage and returning it back into the park. One thing I do want to touch on um, this morning for each of the board members, um, you'll recall or you know that there's a series of pump stations here along the South Dade conveyance system that sort of pick up that seepage water as well as any rainfall that infiltrates the groundwater and makes it into the canal system and returns that to Everglades National Park. Um, you'll recall back in 2020, um, there was a failure of one of the discharge pipes at the 332B pump station um, that caused that pump station to be offline for a period of time while district staff um, effectuated some repairs to that pipe, some temporary repairs. Um, so what I want to bring to your attention is um, just last week, the sister station, 332C, which is just a little bit farther south, um, it also had a very similar failure last week where the discharge pipe um, collapsed. Um, and staff is currently working to effectuate some temporary repairs. Right now, the district over the past year and a half has been in design of replacements for both of those pump stations. Um, we're hoping to bring you a construction contract in February board meeting for the replacement of the 332B pump station. The Corps of Engineers is the lead for the replacement of the 332C pump station, and they would be uh, moving forward on that construction somewhere in the summertime of 2025. So there were temporary repairs that we're trying to do right now to be able to utilize that station for emergency purposes. Um, we'll hopefully get us to at least that point and then throughout the construction duration, which is probably another three years. So we're looking at about another five years before we can get um, the system back up to par and where it needs to be in replacing those temporary infrastructure that is now going on 25 some odd years old. Um, in the meantime, um, we'll continue to be able to 
provide the flood control and operate the system. Um, we always have the ability to move, continue to move that water down through the system and uh, maintain flood protection by moving it to um, Florida Bay and Card Sound out that route. Um, also for this time of year, I just want to point out that the two um, pump stations 199 and 200, which are right about here, are within the Sparrow window. Um, so water levels over here, in the, so it's a double-edged storage. Water le levels over in the park are higher right now because of all those rainfall, but because they're higher and you're in the Sparrow window, we can't operate those two pump stations. Um, so we're continuing to move that water down and promote it down towards the panhandle so it comes out sheet flow down through the panhandle of Everglades National Park down around 18C in that area. Um, we have not yet, despite the heavy rains that this part of the system has received, we have not yet had to open up S197 all the way down at the bottom. So that's a good thing. And we've been able to manage the system with the infrastructure and operations that we have. So looking at inflows to the STAs, um, as I said, things are just starting to pick up, just getting into the wet season. So far, we've had about 84,000 acre feet um, come through the stormwater treatment areas. You can see a very small portion of that um, is associated with moving that lake water south that I had mentioned. Um, we're going to try to resume that operation once again here over the weekend. Um, looking at the climate forecast, um, they're still projecting the above average rains through August, and then equal chances once we get on to the August-October window, and then it flips back over to, it's evolving for South Florida, but at least northern portions of the, of the district, probably above average, and that would be associated with that forecasted um, El Nino that everybody's been talking about. Over the next couple days, um, this is sort of that drying pattern over the next two, three days that I had talked about, and then we'll get back into some rains um, early on next week. So just to wrap it up, um, June 1st was the start of hurricane season. Uh, I know that's probably bad news, Mr. Chauncey, you're having gut reactions. Um, <laughs> but um, this is the forecast for the hurricane season, 12, 17 named storms, five to nine hurricanes, one to four major storms. Um, as I said last month, um, it's still uncertain about how El Nino will continue to develop, but for the tropical season in hurricanes, El Ninos tend to reduce or limit the number of storm events, but the ones that do form um, are more intense and uh, bring more rains. Um, that's all I have for you today, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Mitnick. Any comments or questions for Mr. Mitnick? One quick question. Mr. Butler. Um, John, in Mr. Uh, Carrasco's presentation, he mentioned the flood or the help we were with the Miccosukees on installing a pump for flooding. What's that about? So, let's see if I can find a map to orient. Um, this will work. So, some of the rains that we'd had last week, there was a, a very robust thunderstorm that developed right in this area of the district. Um, and the Miccosukee's reservation down here was flooding, um, so they contacted us and see if we could provide any assistance. So the good women and men of the field station jumped into action and they pulled some of the portable pumps or one of the portable pumps that we had up here, I think in the stormwater treatment area that was helping assist draw down for some vegetation management and loaded it up, brought it down here and deployed it over the weekend, last weekend, to be able to assist um, the tribal members and alleviate some of their flooding. Okay, that was south of Tamiami Trail then? Correct. It, I think it was like right in here, covered up by this big arrow. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mr. Bergeron. Uh, I think we need to move as much water south as we can, understanding that we're in the rainy season. We're foot above on the lake of the 65 year average, I think. And we're foot above an area two uh, in the central Everglades. I think it's important that the S11s continue to release water south uh, to, to get uh, conservation area two to its compatible water levels 
and on and beyond the Tamiami Trail, I think extremely important. And we're really on our toes right now since we're above, you know, water levels in the central Everglades and in the lake. So everything you can do to move water south, I think, would be extremely important, John. Thank you. Anyone else have comments, questions? Great. Thanks, Mr. Nick. I, I actually, oh, I do, Chair. John, quickly, the repair that's being made at the pump station, how long does that uh, temp temporary repair take? Oh, right now we're, we're evaluating it, but the initial information that I've gotten back from uh, the field station and the engineering group is it'll probably take us a week to two weeks to actually do the work itself. Um, there's some materials they got to go procure, so I'm still waiting to find out how long it takes to get all the materials on site to be able to start that work. But the work itself will probably take about a week to two weeks. Yeah, that's better than I thought it would be. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mr. Mending. Mr. Glenn. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, thank you. It's always a pleasure to come provide you the ecological conditions update across the district. Uh, starting up at the top, um, John talked about releases that were being made. Um, what is going on with Lake Kissimmee? Lake Kissimmee starting to come up. We're still, though, releasing 310 uh, to the Kissimmee River. But as rainfall is starting to occur, you're starting to see the floodplain is starting to inundate. I imagine when I come back next month, this, these browns will start to definitely disappear and we'll get into deeper water depths, which is really good for the ecology of the floodplain. Um, we have seen that there has not been water on the floodplain. This is the line right here at about 1400 CFS that is needed in order to inundate the floodplain. So this was last year's uh, really protracted floodplain inundation, which was fantastic. And uh, we'll start seeing that green, I'm imagining, pretty soon. And dissolved oxygen conditions are about six milligrams per liter, which is well above the two milligram threshold that we get concerned about. Uh, coming into Lake Okeechobee, um, the first time in the several months where rainfall has exceeded ET. So ET in the past several months, because it was so dry, was really taking a lot of water off of the lake. Now we've flipped into the wet season, and that's really the big, the big takeaway from this. Uh, and you're seeing inflows coming in are exceeding outflows currently. Looking at where we are, and John talked about this, you know, we are about a foot and a quarter above the ecological envelope. We were starting to track down above it, but we've had that reversal since the rains came. Um, today we're at 14 feet. A month ago we're at 14.9. This is pretty high for this time of year. Um, as, as you look at where we are, and you're coming down in this, and this is 20, uh, 23, two other years were, about, were higher, 2016 and 2018. So when you have high water levels, what was fortunate for those years, 2017 came low. 2019 after 2018 came low. So when you're looking at the lake health and we're talking about this spans, John said that we're probably not gonna get back into the ecological envelope until September. And we're probably gonna ride 14 feet or higher. Summertime is the time when submerged aquatic vegetation grows the most, and this water depth is just too deep. So as we look at this ecological envelope, there's you know, a decrease in water and there's an increase in water. And along this, it, it, there's different parts of the ecosystem that it's important for. This recession is very important for wading bird use and congregating prey for them to, to use. This low part is very important for vegetation growth. This, this slow ascension is good for when you have alligator nests and turtle nests not to get inundated. So there's, there's different parts of the ecosystem that are impacted by where you are in the ecological envelope. 
and maintaining this line across at 14 through the growing season for SAV is problematic for SAV. So we're going to have not a lot of growth this year, if any, and that, of course, will impact bass recruitment, um, you know, a lot of other things. There's a cascading effect through. So if it was possible to have a low year the following year, like happened after these other two years, that's, that would be good. But we don't know what's going to happen because John said there's a potential for El Nino to come and have another high year. But that's just how these things play out, and we'll have to wait and see what happens. Um, last month, I came and said that we're going to have an algal bloom. <laughs> you know, the conditions were right. I don't like being correct, but yes, uh, June 2nd, we did have a full lake bloom. Um, today's, or yesterday's, which we're not able to get in here because of, of getting this out to the public, but it's, it's looking more like this. You have very, very hot colors, and only this section of the lake in yesterday's is, is black. So as we go through this summer, we're going to have this waxing and waning of blue-green algae flaring up and not flaring up. Um, conditions that can impact that. If we get large rain events, it'll physically break it up. Um, we get wind events, it'll push it from one side to the other. So it's going to move around, but it's going to be there through the summer. Um, hopefully, like in years past, when we get these large algal blooms, it uses the nutrient that's there. So better to have it in the beginning of the season than later in the season if the lake comes up and we have to start moving more water. Um, where we are comparatively in the past three years at this point in time, uh, you know, June 2nd was a pretty widespread uh, bloom across the lake. I want to show you how quickly things can change with blue-green algae. So here we know when we get into this season, we sample the lake at 32 stations every other week. So we have a really robust data set that allows us to look at this and see how do conditions change and how does that impact algal blooms on the lake. You see this is a chlorophyll level and we say if you're above 40 when you're this color here or at 40, that's a bloom condition. But we're approaching bloom conditions in several places. But look at toxins. There's only two that are above detection. And then you look at, well, what are the major taxa that are there, five are dominated by microcystis, the rest are all mixed. We go to two weeks later, and you have 10 that have toxins, and 23 sites are dominated by microcystis. So as we move into this, and I had, and I don't think it animated, no, it didn't. I had the temperature <laughs> for the lake up there to show you that temperature is above 25 degrees Celsius, which is where microcystis really likes temperature to be. So we've had above that all through May, <coughs> temperatures are warm, day length is long, there's a lot of opportunity for photosynthesis, and microcystis is taking advantage of that. When we look at what are nutrient levels currently, first you have chlorophyll levels that are kind of low, but this di dissolved inorganic nitrogen levels, this, this one is the um, pelagic, and this is the nearshore. So the nearshore, we've been having a lot of nearshore blooms, and you see that decrease in inorganic nitrogen is being used up. Um, we've had some rain events and, and, and more water coming in and some probably turbulence out in the lake, and so that, that inorganic is a little bit higher. And turbidity is decreasing, so the clearer the water is, this energy source is there, temperature is high, day length is long, that is the condition that algal blooms occur in. Uh, we do conduct treatments here at the district. Um, Rory Feeney's group is, is very adept, and we have daily uh, surveys that are taken in, in forward-facing public areas. And so you see here was a, the Davis boat ramp. It's on the C-43 canal. Uh, on Monday, this was reported to us. We went out on Tuesday and treated, and this is what it looked like on Wednesday. So our treatment program is very nimble, and it's very effective. Um, how did, you treat, how did your team treat it? We treat it with a product that's called uh, Lake Guard Oxy. It's a hydrogen peroxide. Uh, that's the chemical that's used. It's a floating um, encapsulated that's broadcast out onto the surface. So comparative to liquids that will go down into the water column, 
this floats, and what it does is it hyper oxygenates. The, the, when the hydrogen peroxide breaks down, it creates a high oxygen environment that kills blue green algae. But it, it's, not, it's not a toxic chemical that you're thinking about somewhere else. It's hydrogen peroxide that turns into a, a high level of oxygen. And then Pahokee Marina uh, last Friday was, was getting pretty green as well. And uh, we treated uh, twice in that marina. And on Wednesday, you see conditions are, are far better. Um, looking at wading bird use, you know, it was really high. The water levels were really high. And we started having that really good recession in May. And wading birds came back. Um, so they're going to use, based on the HSI here, the Habitat Suitability Index, what depths are like. And when depths are appropriate, the birds will be there. When depths are inappropriate or too deep, they're not. So this is a, it was a, a good recession that we were having that was useful for foraging wading birds. I'm looking at inflows into, this, into the St. Lucie and what the salinity conditions are like. Uh, there's nothing you can see coming from the lake. Everything's coming from the basin and the majority from the tidal basin. And that tidal basin at uh, 1,100 is pretty high. And that's created um, a little further uh, freshening of the estuary. And you see that, again, as salinity is declining. But it's still within the good range for adult oysters. When we go and we look at what's going on with larval or recruitment, that salinity level baby oysters, I'll use that as a term instead of larval, they like salinity to be higher than lower. So in this condition, we saw a decrease, and it was just because salinity had gotten a little too low for them. That's our hypothesis anyway. So we did see a decline in larval oysters. We have a new project uh, in the St. Lucie where we're looking and we're doing zooplankton monitoring. We're doing this at a number of stations all throughout from the, the freshwater forks down into the estuarine and out to where it's getting almost oceanic. And we're doing this every other month and we're trying to look at what is the impact of freshwater inflows on the zooplankton. Zooplankton are the base of the food chain. How does that change through the year? How does it change with fresh water? And if you look at how the data are set up, this is the inlet. So this is the saltiest going to the freshest. Um, in the saltiest area, this blue are, are larval shrimp. So you have a lot. And as salin they like high salinity. And then the red or the dominant in these other are crab larvae, littler and bigger. And so these are, are more adapt to freshwater conditions. And what's interesting as you look at density, how many are there in a unit area, density is highest in the middle estuary. And that is really shows the importance and significance of the middle estuary in estuaries. It's not super salty, it's not super fresh, and it has the conditions that are right for the majority of different species. So if, when you have conditions that are appropriate in the mid-estuary, that is benefiting both the saltwater and the freshwater species and just shows you how important estuaries are. Lawrence, what are you d calling the middle estuary, please? Uh, this is the middle estuary here. So here's a fork. Here's the uh, north fork, this middle estuary. The Saint, they, on some of the maps, they call it the St. Lucie River. So <clears throat> the, the main stem of the river, or whatever. Right. But that, that's where there's the most life? Yes. Um, going over to the Caloosahatchee side, uh, we've been sending pulse releases within the beneficial range um, since December. Uh, we see a really nice salinity gradient going from fresh to brackish to saltier through the end. Um, we have just above the, the threshold for um, adult oysters at two of the sites, and Cape Coral is within it. But we're seeing really good response on this side. Uh, you see this increase at the Iona Cove site and maintaining at the Bird Island site. So conditions are good for oyster recruitment in the Caloosahatchee. Going to the stormwater treatment areas, um, I'm continuing to 
update these slides to try to give you the information I think that is, is best that you can see. So we're going to go through this by water year. So we're going to be accumulating volumes of water that are going through each estuary, and that's depicted by the blue bar. The green bar, or the green dots, are the inflow concentrations this water year. The black dots are the outflow concentrations this water year. And then as comparison, the yellow line is what happened last water year. So if you look across the STAs, we are performing from 13 to 25 currently this water year. STA 5-6 has an inflow of 221 and an outflow of 21. That's phenomenal performance. Um, as, as we are filling STA 5-6, you know the bottom half, I want to get to the maps in a second, last, year, last month was very dry. Um, we're filling those bottom cells up, but the top two flowways are what we're actually pushing water out of currently, and they're the ones that stay hydrated most of the year, and they perform very well. So this is a, this is a good news story for the work that we're doing in the estuaries. We're seeing very good performance so far this year. And I've changed up this slide a bit, and I'm going to take you through each of the stormwater treatment areas their flowways, and what's happening in each one. So in the western flowway, this one is currently offline because we did a lot of work in these two cells, and that is having grow-in currently. And we expect to have them back online in late July. In this middle, we're doing a survey. And here, we had to draw this down. This has, I mean, for lack of better words, it has some undulating topography in there that is not beneficial for the growth of vegetation. So we drew this one down uh, during the dry season so we could go in there and survey it and see what can we do in there to change the topography to make it more amenable for vegetation growth so that that cell can perform the best that it can. So that is offline currently for that survey. It'll be back online uh, by mid-June. Coming over to STA-1 West, here's the eastern, western, northern, and the expansion cells. Uh, what are going on there in the northern? It's online, but all of them have some restrictions on how much water we're going to push through because we're doing a lot of vegetation, and we are doing con some construction as well. And then this MBTA is Migratory Bird Treaty Act, so species black neck stilt that are nesting in there. So that creates a restriction on there. So they are online. We can put water into them, but we're being careful on how we put water into them because we're finishing up that vegetation work from the dry season. Then as you go over to, to SDA 2, instead of eastern, western, they're numbered. So you have flow A 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And currently, we have flow A 2 offline. Uh, we're doing post-construction grow in there. We did a lot of work in there. Um, flow A four and flowway five are receiving 100 CFS of lake water currently to help push through and move water south. Then coming into STA 3.4 and STA 5.6, and I reversed these. I'm sorry, my apologies, but the eastern is actually offline. <laughs> I just noticed that before I came up. But this is the one where this cell, we had to go in and completely rework. It had delaminated, had floating tussocks, and so that work has been ongoing. Um, it's going exceedingly well. We will get it back online in August. We want to slowly bring water up and slowly push water through it so that we don't do any harm to that vast amount of work that we did in that cell. And the central and western flowways are both online. And then as you can see, these bottom flowways last month were very red. Are, are darker, but they are filling, and these are the two flowways, especially flow A1 that we are actually moving water through, and this is the cell, the flowway that is performing exceedingly well. Uh, going to Biscayne Bay, uh, salinity, of course, fluctuates with inflows. Um, we've had uh, pretty good inflows in the past month. Salinity is below 30. Um, those conditions are, are pretty decent. Coming into the Everglades, the, the things that you look at right now, last month we were concerned about that drying in the northwest part of Water Conservation Area 3A, 
And so we're starting to get a return back to water being above ground. Um, we have very good connectivity all the way through Shark River Slough, through Taylor Slough, and over in Lossman Slough. So the Everglades National Park, the amount of water they're receiving right now is looking very good throughout the Everglades. Then finishing up down in Florida Bay, uh, you see this is the interquartile range. I call it the blue brick, blue brick road. <laughs> and as long as you're in that compared to what we've seen in the past, uh, conditions are pretty good. And you see that we're actually in the bottom part of the interquartile range in the western uh, bay. So conditions throughout Florida Bay from a salinity standpoint right now are fantastic. And the wet season's about to occur or is starting to occur. So we're starting to see that change. We have a program where we drive a boat and we go through and take continuous salinity samples all the way through the bay. And this is what we see. And the eastern bay is a little less saline. The western bay is always a little more saline. Uh, but as you saw in the interquartile range, we're doing OK here. It's very comparable to where we were uh, this time last year. And, and this just goes to show that the end of the wet season last year and then how we were able to continue deliveries, how good the salinity setup was um, in January of last year. And with that, here's a lined seahorse in the Indian River Lagoon near Jensen Beach. And I'll happily take any questions that you have. No, thanks very much. So anyone, I have one question. If you can go to uh, slide 19. Certainly. And I'm just trying to figure out what the correlation is input to output. So you've got on SDA 5.6, if that 221 were 100, would there be, would the output be commensurately less, or do we know? We, th we think it will be. Okay. Um, it's definitely easier for the STA to, you know, take in phosphorus and the amount of phosphorus that's going to come through. And remember, we have the C139 FEB FEBs. that is going to be built here. So we're it is going to, to provide, back. it's almost like a, an STA before an STA. Just like for 23, we have the A1 FEB that pre-treats and gets these values very low before they come through. And it, it's, it's easier to polish than it is to remove a large volume. Okay. That, that's my hope, is that when that's online, that 5, 6 become the stars like 3, 4 do. Certainly. Anyone else? Mr. Bergeron? I just want to say one more time that we need to continue to move water out of the uh, central Everglades in uh, area two. Yes, sir. Across the top where we always need water because it dries up quite a bit. And down to and into Everglades National Park. So we have capacity going into the rainy season because earlier we talked that we're, we're expecting probably uh, above average rainfall coming up. So if we can continue to move that water through the S11s and, and have capacity for possible future storms and, and uh, heavy rain that we're projecting, uh, I think that's extremely important. Yes, sir. Agreed. OK. There are no more questions. Thanks, Mr. Glenn. Thanks. Appreciate it. We'll move on now to the monthly financial report with Ms. Heater. Thank you. Good afternoon. So the monthly financial report I'm reporting on today is through the month of April. Uh, the month of April, we've collected, through the month of April, we've collected $537.4 uh, million. We collected $16 million during the month of April, um, as well as we collected out of that 16, 9 million in ad valorem taxes. Our ad valorem taxes, we have collected thus far 294 million out of 306. We are on trend, actually a little above trend. Um, 
Our collections are a little lower than typical. It, they're about 37 million lower. But I would like to bring you up to date that as of today, we've received an additional $55 million um, through reimbursements. Staff sent up over $94 million last month. Um, and they are right now working on a package that, that will be sent up to DEP as well. Um, on the expenditure side, uh, we spent $76 million, so we're averaging in the 70s per month, um, with $40 million in restoration and $25 million in O&M, we have spent thus far $482 million. So we've collected more you know, revenue than we've spent, which is you know, a positive uh, to this point. Um, and we have expended and obligated our budget about 79%. Um, a little additional note in the context of flood awareness, the, the theme, and uh, it being rainy season, I wanted to let you know that we do have a dedicated um, you know, team that does support the field on the procurement side as well as on your budget side. Um, on the budget side, they always at this time of year prepare a resolution in case we do need to come to the board to request special authority to transfer money you know, from other areas within the agency should we need additional funds for fuel and electric. Right now, we are illustrating that we may need about $3.5 million above what is in their budget, um, as, as high as $5 million. You did set aside, uh, Mr. Bartlett and yourselves, in this current budget, 3.5 of one-time funding, so we have enough money, you know, to cover the potential low end if we do need an additional 3.5 million. If we need additional funding above that, then we would bring a resolution to the board uh, requesting authority if we cannot find money within our budgetary authority and or if we need to pull money from reserves. Reserves does have funding set aside in it, our, our emergency reserves for fuel. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And that Thanks, concludes my report. Mr. Butler. Quick question. Uh, you get any idea what taxable values look like across 16 yes, counties? Yes, yes, we Just did. Just a brief, uh, so rough we, idea? Yes, we, they're up. They're up? Yes. Um, Okeechobee County, we did see about 11% increase. Um, and those are our June 1st estimates. Um, as you know, they're required to provide June estimates. July 1 will be the, you know, the, the final taxable values. Not all provide new construction, so I don't have a good indicator on new construction, or I'd report that to you. Um, and then the prior year adjustments, uh, we don't have an, a, you know, anything really that I can provide you on that. So that will come hopefully next month. I'll be able to report on all that, but, but they're up. So 16 countywide on average up? Yes, Great. all. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, the general counsel's report. Ms. Fincher? I don't have a general counsel's report today, Chair. Thank you. Is there general public comment? No, there's not, Mr. Chairman. Is there board comment? Uh, Mr. Butler, Mr. Martinez, Vice Chair, Sir Lipich. Long live the Everglades. You beat him. You beat him to it, <laughs> Mr. Bergeron. I'll second that. <laughs> I, I thought you would, Miss Miss Meads. No, yeah. That's right. no sir. Thanks, uh, uh, Colonel Roman. Nothing. Thank you. Great. Well, I'll I'll stay with that, um, and I will look forward to uh, seeing everyone next month. And uh, this meeting's adjourned. Thanks. Well